Welcome to the People's Maps Commission virtual public hearing for the 7th Congressional District. The hearing will now begin. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. This evening's hearing will include testimony from two subject matter experts who will share how other Midwest states draw fair maps. Katie Fahey, the founder and executive director of The People, an organization that supports individuals to get involved in the political process, and Michael Lee, senior counsel for the Brennan Center's democracy program. Finally, beginning at approximately 7 p.m., the public testimony portion of the meeting will begin. As a reminder, due to the unfortunate and increasing spread of COVID-19, this is a virtual hearing with many participants from around the state and nation, and technology can be fickle even under the best of circumstances. We appreciate in advance the patience and understanding of viewers, as well as presenters and commission members, should there be any technical challenges this evening. With that, I will now hand it over to Commission Chair Christopher Ford to call the hearing to order. Good evening, everyone. I would like to call the fifth hearing of the People's Maps Commission to order. Uh, as a reminder, we don't need a quorum tonight because we won't be voting on any uh, matters. This is an informational hearing only. Uh, when I say your name, uh, if you could just please say present. Uh, starting with the first congressional district, Commissioner Tobias. Present. From the second congressional district, Commissioner Anthony. Present. From the 3rd Congressional District, Commissioner McClellan. I think you're muted, Amory. Sorry, present. Perfect. Uh, from the 4th Congressional District, uh, Commissioner Rangel. Present. Uh, from the 5th Congressional District, Commissioner Ramp. Present. And from the 6th uh, Congressional District, Commissioner Prentice. Present. From the 7th, uh, Commissioner Bissonnette. Present. And from the 8th Congressional District, Commissioner Phillips. Present. And I represent the 4th Congressional District, so we have everyone here. Before we begin tonight's hearing, I want to make sure that the citizens of the 7th Congressional District know uh, that we're having a virtual, virtual hearing here tonight. Uh, and I wanted to, everyone to get to briefly know our commissioners uh, from the 7th District. So I now will invite the commissioners to say a few introductory comments uh, and remarks. So. Um, starting from the 1st Congressional District, uh, Commissioner Tobias. Hi, thank you, Chair Ford, and good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Tobias. I am from Racine, Wisconsin. I live here in Racine. I work for the um, Racine Unified School District. Very happy and honored to be here this evening to sit on this commission and very, well, just extremely excited about uh, the two presenters that we have this evening. So really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tobias. Uh, from the second congressional district, Commissioner Anthony. Good, good evening uh, and thank you, um, Chairman, um, Mr. Ford. I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm Reuben Anthony. Um, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin here. I'm the president of, of the Urban League of, of Greater Madison. And I'm really glad to be involved with this commission uh, to do the work um, that this commission has set out to do. Thank you, Commissioner Anthony. From the 3rd Congressional District, uh, Commissioner McClellan. Yeah, hi, I'm Anne Marie McClellan from Menominee, Wisconsin um, in the 3rd CD. Um, I'm retired uh, and I'm very happy to be on this commission and I've enjoyed um, learning so much. And um, I'd like to make a special welcome to Katie Fahey who is uh, from my home state. I'm a native Detroiter. So um, welcome to someone from Livonia, next door neighbor there. Awesome. Uh, from the 4th Congressional District, Commissioner Ringel. Hello. Thank you, Chair Ford. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Benjamin Rangel. I proudly serve uh, as a high school government teacher at Cristo Rey Jesuit High School here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, from Racine originally, went to school at UW-Madison and then Marquette for my master's. Really excited about tonight. Uh, as always, uh, looking forward to hearing from the members of the 7th Congressional District, uh, the, the constituents there, and hearing uh, why they believe fair maps, like we believe, are so incredibly important for our democracy. So looking forward to everything. Awesome. From the 5th Congressional District, uh, Commissioner Ramp. Hello, good evening. My name is Susan Ramp. Um, I live in Wauwatosa. I am an HR leader at Manpower Group in Milwaukee. and really looking forward to learning and grateful to be here um, this evening. Thank you. Awesome. From the 6th Congressional District, uh, Commissioner Francis. Thank 
you, Chair Ford, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Prentice, and I am a librarian. I live and work in the city of Sheboygan, and I'm happy to be here this evening representing the 6th District. Thanks. Awesome. From the 7th Congressional District, I won't forget you this time, Jason, uh, <laughs> Commissioner Bissonnette. <laughs> yep. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Jason Bissonnette. I, uh, I'm the Dean of Students for the Luke Coudray Ojibwe uh, K-12 School. And I also uh, sit on the Board of Regents for the Board of Trustees for the, uh, the Le Coudre, um, uh College. Um, it, it's absolutely an honor to, to be here tonight. I, I look forward to uh, just hearing everything. And um, I guess I'll have a speech a little later. So awesome. thanks. And uh, from the 8th Congressional District, Commissioner uh, Phillips. Yes, thank you, Chair Ford. Yep, I'm from Appleton, representing the 8th Congressional District. Uh, I'm a retired cancer physician. For the past year or so, I've been working with the grassroots group Fair Maps and represent us here in Wisconsin. And I also just want to say thank you very much to the speakers and to all the citizens that are giving statements tonight to the commission. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, and I'm uh, Chairman Ford, so I am a emergency medicine physician uh, currently in Milwaukee, as well as a Whitefish Bay resident representing uh, with Ben uh, Rangel of the 4th uh, Congressional District. Um, we're very excited to be here in the 7th Congressional District. It's a uh, district that actually has a special place in my heart. It's actually where I started uh, my emergency medicine career in New Richmond, Wisconsin, in the St. Croix area too. And so shout out to Westfield Hospital. Uh, uh, you guys, hope you guys are all doing safe and uh, doing well there. So, you know, I hope everyone in the 7th Congressional District can really see and get a feel uh, for, and for those that are watching throughout the state that we're truly normal, uh, average um, uh, Wisconsinites. Each of us come from different uh, backgrounds and hold different types of jobs, uh, now currently and retired as well. Uh, and, you know, we all just have in common the goal of creating a fair maps and having a fair legislative representative map uh, for, for the state of Wisconsin. And so um, we're hoping to continue these meetings that we're having here and make those fair maps happen and uh, share with you our process in the interim. So. Um, so tonight we're going to uh, hear a little bit from our, our expert speakers to, uh, as well, uh, more so around the, um, uh, the considerations throughout the Midwest as well. We're hoping to have some representatives on from uh, Iowa to kind of give us some insight into the Iowa model as we've been hearing a lot about that from our various speakers as well as from some of the public testimony. Uh, however, we haven't been able to um, you know, have someone uh, come and speak to us from the Iowa uh, Council. And so uh, we're hoping to uh, reach out to them a little bit further, but our guest speakers tonight will have a little bit of information to provide along those lines as well. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we're gonna invite uh, Commissioner Bissonnette to share with us some overview uh, about the 7th Congressional District. So uh, Jason, feel free. All right, well, thank you, uh, Chair Ford and commissioners and to all the people watching from the 7th. Um, so my, my coworkers tell me I have really slow speech patterns. So if I run out of time, give me the, you gotta hurry up. No worries, take your time. <laughs> all right, perfect. Well, like I said, it's my honor to speak uh, tonight just for a few minutes about the 7th Congressional District. Um, as we know, geographically, the 7th makes up uh, roughly a, uh, the northern third of the state. And we span from the way north, the shipyards of Superior, all the way down the St. Croix River Valley to River Falls, over to the iron, old iron ore mines of Hurley, and all the way down to the suburbs of Toma. So we're, we're huge. We make up about 21 whole counties and with portions of five counties on our southern border. Um, <laughs> we, uh, according to the last census, we have over 710,000 residents. So I think for, for me, when I was thinking about this and like how to describe the, uh, the seventh congressional district, um, I think the best way for me to describe like these neck of the woods is just trying to share some things about my own family. And I think um, largely because my family story 
is not unique to uh, many of the folks that live here. So um, I am a, I'm a member of the Kuderay Band of uh, Lake Superior Ojibwe. Um, part of my family made the migration from the East Coast all the way through to Madeline Island where we settled, then moving permanently to the interior of the land. And that was long, long before Radisson and De Garcia came through in 1659 and 1660. So another part of my family uh, homesteaded in a, in a small farming community in Angus, um, which is in Washburn County in the 1940s. Um, they moved here from Allen County, Indiana uh, for the hopes of, of having their own farm. So like, men, so like many of the people up here, I come from a family of trappers, a family of traders, a family of hunters and fishermen. I come from a family of loggers and dairy farmers and mill workers. Um, as a kid, I spent my summers at my grandparents' resort on Lake Chatech, which, Anne-Marie, is the, the northernmost lake in the, in the Red Cedar watershed. Um, so, well, I, I also come from a family of first language speakers. Um, many of my family, they learn English as a third language, um, having spoken Norwegian as a second language in the lumber camps in the 1880s. Um, I come from a family of, of military veterans, having at least one person in every generation who has served either in peacetime or in wartime, um, but has fought for this country in every major conflict since the Revolutionary War. I also have family that rely on harvesting fishing and game, fish and game from public waters and the public lands that make up much of our area. Personally, about 50% of my family's diet consists of things that we have either harvested ourselves or we've grown ourselves. And, and honestly, as, a, as I think about this, you know, as a former hunter safety instructor, for many people around here, the idea of gun control means, uh, you know, keeping your, your gun on safe and muzzle awareness and knowing what your target is and what's beyond. And I say all this because, you know, despite all the polarized positions that, that, I, that we see in the news, I really believe that we have the ability to come together uh, when times are tough. Um, you know, years ago, we've had tornadoes go through Siren and Ladysmith. We've had major flooding and severe storms. We've come together when we're searching for a lost child. People in the seventh congressional come together for the common good. But we also come together for the sake of celebration. Uh, you know, the seventh congressional, we're, we're, we're connected through celebration of fruits and vegetables, which, uh, you know, we love our apple fest and we love our cranberry fest. We celebrate rutabagas. You know, we are the land of pumpkin patches and cheese houses and butcher shops and fish fries and old fashions. We're, we're a place where it's not uncommon for old men to sit and congregate over coffee every morning in little towns, attempting to solve all the problems. This is also where young women hope to be crowned uh, the musky queen or Miss Trout Fest or, or to become the bluegill royalty. You know, we believe in the, the purity of things like the homecoming parade for football down Main Street or Friday night football games. You know, we honor the earth during, at, for, at powwows during the summer. You know, so it's a, it's a pretty unique place. But we're also, the reality is we're also subject to the decisions made by a group of people from downstate. Uh, for, many, for many years I've said that we're, we're living a legacy of isolation up here, um, certainly for tribal people, but for many other folks as well. 
Um, Sawyer, Sawyer County, where I live, is, uh, is the third most impoverished county in the state. Um, I think we have what seven stoplights are in, in our entire county. We're ranked number 68 or 69 out of 72 counties for overall health. Um, you know, just by just by changing our zip code, we would be healthier people. Um, we also we also live with the on um, a lot of the decisions that are made that absolutely impact us. Things like the unfounded mandates uh, to our schools or shoreline and water quality standards. We live in a place where the Tavern League has more political power than educators or public health professionals. So, so equality and representation for me is absolutely critical. And I, I'm excited about this hearing. I'm excited to hear more from the people of the 7th. I had, I had uh, some opportunity to, to speak with some folks before and, it, and their insight is, is valuable. Um, and, and again, Chairman Ford, I'm absolutely honored to be a part of this process. And, uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing more from, uh, from folks tonight. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. You know, I love these introductions because, you know, in, this, in the state of the pandemic, you know, I feel like we have very limited opportunities to interact with one another and just learning more about you guys and learning about your district is, is really um, is something that is you know, invaluable at this point. So thank you for sharing all that um, and about your background and everything else. It was, it was beautiful, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. So as the commission has learned uh, over the last few meetings, developing a legislative district map um, is a complicated science that can be looked at from a lot of different um, perspectives and views, uh, and it can impact individuals in, in many different ways. Uh, tonight, again, we're pleased to introduce two different individuals who will be talking with us about how other Midwest states draw uh, fair maps. And so uh, before we begin, I want to ask the commissioners to please save their questions at the end, as we normally will do, uh, until both of these this evening's uh, presenters have been allowed to speak. Um, and so uh, afterwards, we'll kind of do our question and answer, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So um, our first um, presenter tonight is uh, Katie Fahey. Uh, she's the founder and executive director of uh, The People, um, which is an organization that empowers individuals to get involved in the political process. Uh, previously, Katie was the executive director of uh, Voters Not Politicians, uh, where she led over 14,000 volunteers across the state of Michigan uh, to pass a ballot proposal uh, with about 61% of the vote made, um, which made uh, political gerrymandering illegal. Uh, so, um, you know, without further ado, uh, Katie, thank you for taking the time to participate in this evening's hearing, and I'll turn it over to you. Hey, uh, so nice to join you. I'm not, my video has been disabled, but I was hoping to share my screen if that's all right. Perfect. Yeah, it should be good. Perfect. Oops, that was the wrong share. <laughs> all right. Well, hello. It is so nice to be meeting with you guys. My name is Katie Fahey. I, uh, that intro was perfect. Can you guys hear me all right? Just wanted to check. All right, perfect. So I actually am pretty relatable to uh, the situation that you guys find yourselves in. I My background was not in redistricting. I did not used to spend all of my evenings thinking about what are the right criteria and what position should we put them in. Um, but my journey actually started with a Facebook post. Uh, it was um, in Michigan, I'm sure you guys heard about the Flint water crisis. We've had many things that have happened in the last couple of years that just really felt like there was an extreme lack of accountability from our government to our people. So I made a Facebook post, not thinking it would lead to amending the state constitution. But soon I started to see that I wasn't alone in my frustration that quote unquote, taking on gerrymandering was a really popular idea. And uh, and I suddenly was flooded with thousands of messages of other people who wanted to do the same thing, which required me to become a gerrymandering expert. I had to actually Google, how do you end gerrymandering? I knew I didn't like it. I knew we wanted a new process, but I had no idea what the right way to do that was. Um, and with thousands of other citizens across our state, 
Uh, we did use the citizen-led ballot initiative process. I know Wisconsin does not have that, but in Michigan, if we come together, write constitutional language, gather a bunch of signatures for the 2018 ballot, it was 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures in 110 days. Then we can take a proposed law and put it in front of uh, the people of our state to vote on in a general election. So that's the process we followed. And although there were many parts of that process, um, probably the, the most important, most relevant to this meeting is actually how we wrote our constitutional language. Uh, we had a lot of really great smart people from the beginning who were volunteering, but especially because this law was going to go in our constitution, we really wanted to make sure that it was for, by, and of the people of our state. Uh, Jason, your remarks reminded me so much of why we actually started in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, a very rural part of Michigan, because one of our first uh, volunteers said, you know, our opinion in our community is never taken into account with policy. We are consistently just dictated to by the bottom part of the state and their interests. And we have interests of our own and input of our own. And so when we were thinking of writing this constitutional language, we actually traveled across our state. We have 14 congressional districts. We went through all of them at least twice and then had some additional meetings too, but did 33 town halls in 33 days where we had a survey that actually asked people if we were going to draw the districts differently, what would that look like? We also asked them with how we draw and what the process is right now, do you like it? Don't you like it? What would you change? We took extra time to go to communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the current redistricting process, uh, examples being the Upper Peninsula, as well as Detroit, um, which has uh, been hit hardest when new district lines are drawn, to make sure we heard from those communities and what was most important to them. We did best practices and research. We worked with experts across the country, studied what every other state that had a commission, which at the time was a lot smaller than it is now, which is, um, I'm really excited to see that it's more than doubled since our journey started in 2016. Uh, but Michael Lee, who will be speaking after me is one of those great experts that we had. And then we of course made sure everything we were doing was in legal compliance. Uh, at the end of our process, what we got was a process focused on being fair, impartial and transparent, where a group of citizens, a commission, would go across our state, listen to their neighbors and figure out how can they draw districts that hold the maximum amount of representation for people, that that would really be one of the criteria we were looking at. So for the feedback and how I'll structure the rest of kind of what I'd love to share is in the way that we ask people for feedback. We ask them who should draw these lines? Do we like that politicians do it? If not, who should? what should the criteria be for drawing those maps and how should this process take place and what should it look like overall the key concepts that we tried to incorporate because from all of that research that we did we heard these themes over and over and over again we incorporated into each of the parts of our constitutional language people really wanted a body and maps that were representative and reflective of what the people of michigan actually look like of how the people of Michigan actually vote, of um, the geographic diversity of our state. People really just wanted a, a body that looked like that. They wanted fair and equal treatment applied to all Michiganders, regardless of who they voted for or what party they vote for, an impartial process free from political influence as much as possible, a transparent process, meaning they wanted to be able to see how it happened, wanted to be able to participate in it, wanted to be able to actually replicate the results, uh, there are, there were previously kind of laws around redistricting in Michigan, but when you tried to follow those rules, the maps that you would get were very different from the ones that were actually adopted. Um, they wanted a process that proactively sought participation as well as electoral outcomes that are reflective of those maps. And I'll get more into that later. So starting with the commissioners, um, in general, I kind of already talked about this, but a big point of contention was really wanting to make sure that there was demographic, so income level, uh, uh, cultural considerations, um, as well as geographic diversity, people from different parts of the state actually making and comprising the commission, so that hopefully when folks were coming and giving public testimony, they could be understood by the commission and they would have some kind of relevance to, to why um, 
to what they were trying to say and how they were trying to talk about the community. They wanted equal political representation between Democrats, Republicans, and independent or third party voters. In Michigan, we don't directly publicly register for a party, but still wanted to make sure that representation was there. Didn't want political insiders, and the commission is actually selected through a random lottery process because there wasn't one body that felt free from political influence. A lot of our uh, leaders of different organizations, departments in our government are appointed by the governor and people felt like that was be politically biased. Um, I just included these graphics kind of as a uh, something that I thought was a little funny. So as part of our survey results, um, even more unpopular than current lawmakers getting to directly choose their own representatives, lobbyists at 95% of people said, we for sure don't want lobbyists, directly registered lobbyists to be on the commission. Our final commission is 13 members, four Republicans, four Democrats, and five non-affiliated voters. And then I'm happy to share this presentation afterwards. I actually linked to the direct constitutional language that's uh, in our constitution so that if you guys wanted to see the direct reference, you could as well. Um, all right, moving on to criteria. So for criteria, how should these maps actually be drawn and what order should they be drawn in? Um, for us, previously, we just had the criteria not in the constitution. So adding it to the constitution added a lot of weight to the order and the ability to litigate against um, if the criteria isn't being followed by our independent commission. And one of the top themes that we had in the criteria was really making sure that our criteria maximize districts where voters have shared interests. I listed the criteria in a very short width, the, the bottom part of this slide. And so if you look at it, you know, the first criteria is that we need to follow the law. We need to follow all federal laws, the Voting Rights Act, all that. The second is being contiguous, meaning that you know, your district has to touch all the different parts of the district can't be in the, and not touching in the state. But the third is that communities of interest criteria, basically saying that uh, people should be able to have economic shared interest, heritage shared interest, um, interest that they define that could, where they can advocate the need for representation. Now, this was number three very intentionally because uh, number five, which is following existing political boundaries, so your existing county lines, your existing city lines. One of the problems that we kept hearing from a lot of folks is that, especially when it comes to county lines, there's many communities that bridge over, over that line, that, that a city might have much more in common with the city that's directly located next to it um, than the actual overall county for how they want representation to be had. So Jason, another, while you're speaking, this was a, an example that came to mind to me in the Upper Peninsula, more rural part of the state. Right now, how the districts are drawn, one of our biggest cities, Big Bear up there, uh, has only one main road coming out of that district. And that road isn't actually, it, it isn't connected to any other city that's found in, in that district. It's, it, the, the district line actually cuts it in half so that if a representative or a politician wanted to drive to Big Bear, they would have to leave their district and come back into it. Um, it doesn't make sense to people who live there. That's when we looked at the maps, people said, you know, I have no idea why our city is tied with all these other cities because we never even talked to them. Like there's not, there's literally not a road to those cities. And yet the cities that we do have roads to, we aren't in the same district. And we have much more in common. A lot of us work in the city that's next to us, even though we live over here. And when we go and want to talk to our representative about the concerns we have, there's much more in common with those lines. And so by putting communities of interest as number three, it allows for more flexibility in how that criteria can be applied before those, again, existing political boundaries. We still have political existing boundaries as one of the criteria, but by placing it underneath uh, the respective communities of interest, it allows just enough flexibility for the commissioners to be able to say, this, uh, this shared economic interest can trump the ability, uh, the, the, the county line, or it can trump the city line or whatever that may be. Uh, happy to go into more examples of that too. Um, we also, with our communities of interest definition, I'm going to go to the constitutional language that we have here, which is um, the communities of interest one is number C. We defined it as may include but shall not be limited to populations that share cultural or historical characteristics or economic interests. Communities of interest do not include relationships with political parties, incumbents, or political candidates. Um, 
we did directly say that basically political affiliations will not count in our definition and the rest of it we kept fairly flexible. And the reason we wanted to do that is right now we had a pretty thorough understanding of, of the communities of interest that the people of Michigan would hold um, in different parts of the state, but in 40 years we're not sure how our state will change and so we wanted to make sure we were putting criteria where that definition was flexible enough to change over time. Um, and then the last thing that I really wanted to highlight for criteria, when we were starting and we were going out and talking to people, there was a lot of confusion about the word competitiveness and competition in relation to criteria for redistricting. And a lot of people kept saying they wanted competitive districts, but that's not actually what they meant. Competitive, dist competitive districts would be more like trying to make sure that a district could be won by a Democrat or a Republican. And people were actually okay with having certain parts of the state that tend to vote more blue and tend to vote more red. They didn't feel like we should kind of try and falsely even the playing fields when, when the communities aren't defined that way. But what the, the criteria they were trying to get at was the concept of symmetry, meaning that about, you know, for decades, about 50% of Michiganders vote for Democrats and about 50% of Michiganders vote for Republicans. And yet, depending who's done the last redistricting cycle, you might have 70% of the seats, 70% of the people elected that are for one party or the other, even though 50% of people, they only got 50% of the vote as an example. And that's political symmetry. If you actually had a 50%, 50 of your elected officials, Democrat, 50 of your elected officials, Republican. Um, and so we tried to incorporate that as well as part of not only the criteria and the order, but also how the maps are as a part of this. Um, and we didn't include competitiveness because when we were listening to the people of Michigan, that really wasn't a top concern. It was much more about how do we get a district that actually means that when you look at the map, all of us have shared interests and we can hopefully get our representative to bring those representative to bring those uh, concerns to our state capital and bring those concerns to Washington. Um, and lastly, the line drawing process in and of itself. So what I mean by line drawing process is how does this all happen? What does it look like? Um, how, what are the ways that the commissioners interact, all that. Uh, really strong focus on transparency, one that invites public observation and participation. Uh, mandatory public meetings are actually held before maps are even drawn. Um, and part of those public meetings actually puts on the commissioners that they have to help educate the public about what the redistricting process is. Especially because it only happens once every 10 years, uh, people often need a reminder of what this means. The other important part, especially for this first year of our redistricting commission is up until this point, we've never had a commission. So people, even though they're excited to give public input, they're not really sure how. And so we really wanted to make sure the commission would proactively assist people in making sure they knew how to use the process. Uh, our maps do require a majority of the commissioners to adopt them with at least two of the Republicans, two of the Democrats, and two of the non-affiliated voters before any one map can be uh, incorporated. And that goes back to that concept of fairness that people wanted to see. We have a requirement of open meetings and the use of technology. Little did we know how relevant that would be in the age of COVID. Um, really glad we put that in there, but we did make sure that the constitutional language encouraged the commission to uh, basically proactively be going out to make sure that people could attend even if they couldn't physically be there. Um, and then public comment and participation is also highly encouraged throughout the process. This includes the public being able to submit their own maps. It also put requirements on the commission that when they came out with their recommendations of maps, they actually had to be maps. One of the problems in Michigan or that we heard about the current existing public process that we had before this commission was that when the legislature was going to pass maps, they would just have a list of census tracts. And so if you only had 24 hours to give public feedback and you have no idea, you don't have the census tracts memorized, um, it was really hard to understand what kind of public feedback to even give because you weren't sure what it looked like and where those community lines actually were drawn. Um, so some of those little pieces were in there. Again, I have the constitutional language. This is in multiple sections of the constitution. So you have a couple slides from that for you guys to be able to read and look at the specifics of it if that's helpful. Um, all right, and so in general, that was our, our overall process. Um, 
really hearing an emphasis on how can we make sure this is that having representative government is actually about representation. How can we make sure that our communities are reflected in this? How can we actually participate in this process? Um, one of the other things I didn't put on this slide, but even after a map is drawn, there's a required amount of meetings that have to be held before it can be adopted by the commission to make sure that the public has a chance to actually give input. Uh, and um, each of the commissioners after the maps are finalized need to submit actually a written report of why they think that that map followed the criteria that we put in place and add another layer of accountability for um, these maps being drawn with purpose and not just based on what people personally feel like is what the criteria should be. Uh, our independent commission in Michigan has started. So I just included the information on that as well. You can go to our Secretary of State's website, but they also have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, where they post their commission meetings. You can see the public comment that's being submitted. I wasn't sure if that would be helpful or not for your process, but um, much like how you guys run your meetings, it's very similar uh, and um, you've got some kindred spirits as your, your neighbors. And that's all I had. Awesome, thank you so much, Katie, we appreciate it. Um, so we'll transition to our second uh, uh, presenter. So our second presenter is Michael Lee. Um, as Katie was saying, uh, you know, he's uh, uh, another powerhouse in this redistricting effort uh, in the process of creating fair maps. Uh, he's a senior counsel for the Brennan Center's uh, Democracy Program, uh, which focuses on redistricting voting rights as well as elections. Um, in addition to his election law work, um, uh, uh, Michael Lee previously served as executive director of uh, B1 Texas, which is a donor alliance that oversaw strategic and targeted uh, investments in nonprofit organizations. Uh, working to increase voter participation as well as engagement in historically disadvantaged uh, African-American and Hispanic communities within uh, the state of Texas. Uh, so uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us and uh, I will turn it over to you now. Well, thank you for having me and, and um, I'm glad to be here and glad to help out in whatever way um, we can. And it's good to see Katie there as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint, which I think I can manage to do. Yep, we go. Oh, here we go. You would think I would have this more down, slightly more down, given um, <laughs> where we are. Well, let's see. Are you seeing the PowerPoint? Yes. Yep, okay. 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 There we go. So I was asked to talk a little bit about the the way that redistricting is done in Iowa, um, which is a state that many people oftentimes um, think about um, when they think about redistricting because it seems very appealing to people. Um, and there are certainly things that are really good about Iowa, but um, it's also very unique. Um, and in some ways it doesn't necessarily fit well for other states, uh, but there are certainly learnings out of Iowa that are important. Um, and so I'll, I'll just start by, by talking a little bit about Iowa. Um, so it, it, as I said, it's a very unique way of redistricting um, because rather than politicians drawing maps, rather than um, a commission drawing maps, uh, career staff at the Iowa Legislative Services Agency draw the maps, both the congressional maps and the legislative maps. And that's something that's, um, very unique in the sense that um, you know, you know, it's um, civil servants who are drawing the maps. Uh, Missouri um, was going to have something similar uh, this decade, uh, but they ended up repealing that before it could go into effect. Um, so the Iowa model really sort of stands out in that regard. Um, now, Iowa in Iowa, the uh, LSA, the Legislative Services Agency, is assisted by a citizen advisory commission that um, is supposed to provide advice and is responsible for holding hearings on the maps. But um, the reality is that the advisory commission really doesn't have much of a role other than holding the hearings um, in part um, because the rules in Iowa are so mechanical, um, you know, 
um, we did interviews with people um, who served on the commission and, and asked them, you know, sort of what their role was. And they said, we got lots of people saying you should do X or do Y. And the reality is like, because the rules are so mechanical, you can't do X or Y. Um, and so, you know, they were just there to, you know, basically let people have a chance to participate in the process, but you know, the, the, you know, the, the maps are going to be what they, they are. Um, but nonetheless, there, there is sort of the citizen's advisory commission that goes alongside that. Now in Iowa, the commission is only an advisory commission, which means that whatever the legislative services agency does, the legislature has to pass. And in Iowa, as in some other states that have these advisory commissions, it's an up or down vote. So they, they either can accept the whole map or reject the whole map. They are allowed to make some technical corrections on the map as defined by state law, but they can't make big changes to the map. They can only like if, for example, the, the boundary of a town, they meant to include the whole town, but you know for some reason the, the data that they had was sort of off. Um, they can correct for that sort of thing, but they can't make changes. They can only vote up or down. If they reject a map, um, if one of the houses rejects a map, then um, it goes, um, the, 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 the legislative service agency creates a second map and that also is subject to an up or down vote with technical corrections permitted. Um, and if that goes down, then the legislature is free to draw its own map um, subject to the same rules, um, but it, it is subject, it, it, you know, it can draw its own map. Now, the reality in, um, Iowa is that, you know, since 1980, like they've never rejected an LSA drawn map. Um, and so the legislature has been pleased with what has been done and the process has worked um, really, really um, well. Um, now I will, I mentioned that Iowa's rules are very mechanical and they're very strict also. Um, Iowa does not allow much deviation in the size of the population of districts. Um, the mean deviation is only limited to 1%. The total deviation from the largest to the smallest district is only 5%. In federal law, that you could have up to 10% for legislative districts. And so it's, it's very tight, um, which limits some flexibility um, in some cases, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's also a great deal of emphasis in Iowa on political subdivisions, counties, um, towns and cities, and their rules about which towns and counties you split, uh, well, which towns you would split first or counties, you know, in other words, you would split the larger ones over the smaller ones. And so, you know, the, the rules again are, are, are very strict. Um, Iowa also has requirements that uh, districts look nice as much as possible. Um, they call that convenient contiguous territory, and also that districts be reasonably compact. Um, that's a requirement that not all states have, but Iowa does. Um, it So those are sort of the basic mechanical rules. Iowa also has in its law um, an anti-partisan gerrymandering provision, um, which says that you can't favor political party or incumbent or legislator um, or any other group, and you can't um, dilute the voting strength of language or um, racial minorities. Um, and this is, you know, very good language. Um, Michigan has similar language, and, and you know, a growing number of states have this, and that's a, an important check on some of the the abuses. Um, last but not least, um, in Iowa, the staff are not permitted to consider political data, election results. Um, party registration, or to take into account the addresses of incumbents. Um, so they can't say that that Katie Fahey lives, you know, at this address and we're trying to draw this, draw her out of her district. And so we'll, you know, they, they, they just don't have that information. So the staff, you know, do this blindly. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, that's a very quick overview of Iowa's rules. Again, um, as you saw from the, the previous slide, they're, they're very, you know, there's a lot sort of about political subdivision. There's a lot about, you know, um, uh, the, the size of districts, you know, how much deviation you could have. Um, there's rules on compactness. Um, what you don't see there are rules about like keeping communities together necessarily. Um, what you don't see there are, um, you know, uh, rules on like, you know, um, coalitions between various people, you know, like between like Latinos and 
Asians, like in, in, in which is like Queens in, in New York City, where I live, um, you know, there are oftentimes are, are multiracial coalitions, which might make sense to keep in a district, but that's just not something that you would ever consider um, in Iowa. So, you know, that's an example of something that isn't sort of there. And lastly, you know, there is no requirement of competitiveness, um, which sometimes people like to see, you know, so Iowa just does not, it, it just has very mechanical uh, line drawing rules, um, which staff can apply and they feel very comfortable applying because these are rules that don't require a lot of sort of discretion. And so if you talk to the people at the LSA, they don't feel like they're they're making political decisions. They, they feel like they're just applying formulas. Um, and so they themselves will say that they feel like they're they're very comfortable with with doing what this doing this. Um, and the result, um, as you'll see, this is Iowa's current state house map. Um, you'll see it's um, you know compared to many. And I originally come from Texas. If you compare this to like a, a map of the Texas state house, um, this looks remarkably beautiful. Um, you know, it it is uh, the districts seem mostly well shaped. Um, and they seem mostly like they, you know, they're, they're you know, um, you know, it, 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 they're, you know, it, it, I think most people looking at this would say this is a very good map. Uh, the congressional map, even, you know, from some standpoints, even looks better. Iowa has four congressional districts. And Iowa is unique in not having a rule that you can't split counties on a congressional map. And so the counties are not split, as you'll see. Um, and um, you know this this looks kind of fair, right? I mean, you might do something that's slightly different, um, but um, a good result. Now, I said at the beginning that Iowa's motto is not for everyone, and there are a number of reasons for that. And let me go through some of them right away. Um, and the first is that um, Iowa, um, as you can tell by this uh, picture that I picked for an illustrative example, is a very white place, right? Uh, you know, it doesn't have a lot of people of color. Um, it's mostly white. You know, there might be some distinction between like Norwegians and Germans, but you know, that's sort of where you get. Um, and you know, the the uh, you know, I, I joke a little bit about that, but the what that means is that you're not, for, you know, you don't have a lot of issues with compliance with the Voting Rights Act. You don't have a lot of claims for. Um, districts that elect, um, you know, racial or ethnic minorities just because they're they're not large enough. Um, I'm not, Iowa does have non-white people. It, it's just that they're not like district size concentrations of um, non-white people such that you would have to like make difficult choices about what to do there, right? You can apply very mechanical rules um, to a mostly white population. I believe Iowa is like either the first or the second most white state in the country. Um, and um, you know it works out, right? So that you don't have to make the hard choices. And, and you know this would not work. Um, people in Iowa, um, Ed Cook at the Legislative Services Agency has said um, that he doesn't think the Iowa model would work, for example, in a state like California, uh, which is much more demographically complicated. Where um, if you draw a district to the left. Um, uh, you end up with a district that elects a Latino candidate. If you draw it a little bit to the right, you, you end up with a district that elects a black candidate. And so there are real world implications for the various communities which live you know, very close in proximity to another and layer on top of each other. And you really should, um, you know, if you want to do this right, like think about like, okay, like, you know, do we, we have, you know, do we want Latino representation or black representation because how we draw the line actually will matter um, in that regard. Um, and that will have major world impacts on like the ability of communities to have effective representation, to have a seat at the table in, in the case of California and Sacramento um, to argue for things that they, they want, right? Um, and I'll give you an example of something like, this is a district that is in Chicago that many people consistently call it gerrymander and that they hate. Um, they just they describe it, um, um, you know, as um, like the earmuffs district, right? It, it sort of like looks like a sideways pair of earmuffs. And the um, what this is though, um, you know, so in, under Illinois law, districts have to be continuous, so they have to be connected. And so to connect these two parts, the two earmuffs, um, you they drew this like long line along the highway and to and through some neighborhoods to try to connect 
um, the two pieces in the ear mouths, but the big pieces are two very heavily Latino sections of the city of Chicago. And in between um, the ear mouths is a very uh, black part of Chicago, right? And so what the map drawers were attempting to do with this district is to join two large Latino populations, which are not that far apart, actually, if you're physically there, because you would not drive, if you're driving the district, you wouldn't, you would, you would not go like a C shape, right? You wouldn't do that. You would just go straight up or down. And the people in the two earmuff pieces, like travel between them all the time. They shop in one or the other part. They go to school. They have friends and neighbors. They live, you know, sometimes in one part and sometimes in the other part, right? You know, as they move apartments or houses. Um, and what this really did is it tried to like say, okay, we want black representation in Chicago, um, but we also recognize that we are an increasingly Latino city. We want to have some Latino representation. And so we created this district um, for Latinos. Now, um, you know, which is something that, um, you know, you could disagree with that. You could disagree with, you know, the, the, the wisdom of that. Um, but, you know, it is a policy choice that was made um, in the case of Chicago that Iowa's rules would not allow for because they're very mechanical and they don't, you know, this this violates any number of, of the rules that you have in Iowa, right? Um, so, um, which I guess is, a, you know, the point, like Iowa, what, what Ed Koch and others would tell you, um, you know, is, um, you know, the central feature of Iowa um, is that, you know, you know, the legislative staff does it, but really a computer could draw something like that because it's not, it's programmable, right? You know, you know, a computer can't make decisions like this, um, but it also can't take into account communities. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I mentioned that there's no dictate in Iowa's rules about keeping communities together. Um, and this is the language from California, which talks about keeping communities of interest together. This is very common language. Michigan's language is similar to this, um, a little bit different. Um, but you know, this is language which um, California itself got from a court case um, when the court was trying to decide, it, the court was responsible for drawing a map. And the court said, okay, well, here's, we're gonna to try to keep communities together and here's how we're defining communities. And the, and that definition then got embedded into California law. And you'll see um, there's a lot of words there, but um, you know, a community of interest is a contiguous population that shares common social and economic interests of the type that mean that they should be in a single district, right? You know, um, you know, that they have sort of representational needs. They they're young families all together, or they're it's a community of older people. Um, you know, like, you know, probably something like being, a, you know, like a, like, I don't know, a Green Bay Packers fan or a Dallas Cowboys fan would not be something that you would necessarily have to put together in a district for, um, you know, um, representation needs. But there are certain communities, you know, based on economics, based on social um, issues, like that do have shared concerns and should be in, in a district together. And so this is the language from California. Um, and the example that I like to give about California that I think is oftentimes helpful about why this type of language is good is in California, the commission um, there, um, it's drawn one set of maps, it drew maps in 2011. It heard testimony, um, it held 41 hearings around the state. And it, when it was in the Los Angeles area, it heard testimony from people who said, um, we live in the foothills of Los Angeles and we want to be kept in one state assembly district. And if you know anything about Los Angeles, you know, you, you can't actually drive through the foothills, right? You can't drive all the way through without, you know, people live in the foothills um, and they drive into the valley to go shop, to go to school, to work. Um, and so historically the districts have joined parts of the foothill with parts of the valley, right? They were valley foothill, valley foothill, valley foothill districts. Um, but the people in the foothill said, we want to be in one legislative district for a big reason, which is um, nobody's paying attention to our biggest issue, which is wildfires, right? Nobody, um, you know, we constantly get bedazzled by wildfires and or bedeviled by wildfires. Um, and we want, we want to be able to have representation in Sacramento that will, um, somebody who will pay attention to wildfires. And this, the commission heard that testimony, found it really compelling and said, you know what, we're gonna put them all in a district. Now, they would have also been very reasonable 
to have dr continued drawing valley to foothill districts because those are other types of communities, right? We don't belong to one community, we belong to multiple communities and you have to decide which of the communities gets priority. Uh, but that's, some, that's a human judgment, right? And it's something that happened because people heard the testimony and they found it to be compelling. And that's something that Iowa's rules would not allow, right? You know, it, it, Iowa, you know, may, you know, it just isn't a factor um, in Iowa at all. Um, and so um, the commission drew this, this district that kept the foothills together. And lo and behold, in the, in the next election, um, then the foothills, Democrats were running, Republicans were running, but everybody was talking about wildfires, what they were gonna do to prevent them, what kind of services they were gonna provide. Um, and people got the representational need that they wanted. And so um, this is an example of like why you can't necessarily, for example, many people oftentimes say we should have computers draw the maps, right? You know, and, and you know, it should be, we should, you know, that's the fairest way. Um, but really, like, you know, um, you know what, what representation is about at one level is about making sure that um, our legislatures look like the people as a whole, a miniature of the people as a whole, to paraphrase John Adams um, at the time of the country's founding. Um, and, you know, deciding what it is uh, does involve an element of, of, of uh, human judgment. And, you know, if done right, um, people... Um, as in California, they took they took the job of preserving communities of interest really seriously, um, and the people who came up with the California Commission told will tell you they never thought that there would be a wildfire district, right? The, the district based on wildfire interest, um, but um, lo and behold, that's one of the things that happened. So, um, last but not least, um, the reason that Iowa does not necessarily work everywhere is that there is huge bipartisan trust in the legislative services agency. And the guy pictured there is Ed Cook, um, head of the legal counsel for the agency. Um, and people just trust him, like right? they, they know that he's going to, you know, um, and, and so a key thing, um, you know, having worked on redistricting reform in lots of states, oftentimes the thing that you will find is that people trust no one, right? You know, um, that was certainly was the case in Michigan. I'm, you know, there was a lot of back and forth about what about this person? No, we don't trust that person. We, what about this person? We don't trust that person. So, um, you know, the fact that Iowa has a high level of trust um, in, its pro in its civil servants um, is key. Um, and just to recap, um, some of the things that are good about Iowa um, that I think are, are good models for reform going forward, like they have anti-partisan gerrymandering language, which I I think is essential. Um, and also there is a role for the legislature, which I think is not impermissible, right? You know, and Iowa is pretty strict. It's an up or down vote with only technical corrections. Other states like Washington state allow the legislature to make small corrections, um, you know, sort of where they think the, you know, the commission, um, you know, didn't quite make the judgment that the, the legislature would have, but they can't make wholesale changes, right? So if they split town A instead of town B and everybody thinks, okay, really it's it's better to split town B rather than the town A for whatever reason, the legislature in Washington can make that correction, but they can't rewrite the map in a whole. Um, and so that oftentimes is, is a good um, balance. Um, so, uh, but with that, I, I'll, I will stop and be glad to answer any questions um, uh, about Iowa, um, which again, as I said, is a very popular model that um, people oftentimes go to, but it's it's not a model which even Ed Cook um, from the LSA will tell you um, is particularly well suited for other states. So um, thank you. And I will see how I can end my screen share. If I stop sharing. <laughs> No, here we go. Uh, I can still see you. Yeah, no, there we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, you would think you. after you would think after all like nine months of the pandemic, I would have that down, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> it's a learning process for us all. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, you know that, that was fantastic, and uh, you know I think you read the minds of everyone uh, here on the commission uh, uh, regarding the Iowa model. We wanted a little bit more information of it. We got uh, an amazing presentation as well as you and Katie, so appreciate it. Um, so we're going to open up the floor to any questions for both of our uh, speakers. That any of the commissioners may have. Um, I'll go in order of congressional districts. And tonight uh, we're going to switch it up a bit. So we're going to start with the eighth congressional district and kind of work our way back. Um, uh, so Tony, uh, you, you, you'll be going first there. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right, um, Mr. Lee. Um, this wasn't on your presentation, but would you be able to comment on the trend nationally for nonpartisan commissions in other states? I mean. I think clearly there is a trend, like I was reading a newspaper article today, 
uh, involving a legislature here near Green Bay, Wisconsin. And his comment was, the legislature draws the maps. They've always drawn the maps. We're going to draw them this year. But, you know, clearly that's not the case uh, more and more. And just for the record, could you talk a little bit about the trend? Sure. Um, I'm glad to do so. Uh, you know, the, um, you know, last decade was sort of like a, like a, there was a big burst of reform last decade, including the creation of independent commissions in Michigan and Colorado. Um, I think before that, you know, I'll, well, a couple of reasons before that, you know, a lot of people had been skeptical about commissions because the states that had had some form of commission um, were relatively small states. Arizona was one of the larger states that had a, a, a commission and a very good one, but, you know, Arizona it, is not a particularly large state. And, you know, the other states were states like, um, you know, Idaho or Montana, which are, you know, very small and demographically homogenous. And then you have California, um, which is a large, very demographically complicated state where you have like 20 Latino groups and like 20 Asian groups, right? All, you know, and like, it's just like really complicated, right? And so the fact that the California Commission was a big success in 2011, I think helped fuel a lot of um, interest because it was a proof of concept that a well-designed commission can produce much better maps that produce, you know, the California Commission can't look at political data um, and yet, um, just by keeping communities together, um, it ended up with much more electorally competitive maps. Um, you, you saw that in, in 2018 when Democrats won a bunch of congressional seats in Orange County that had historically been Republican. Um, and you saw it this year, 2020, where you know a, a large number of the seats that Republicans won um, in, in the 2020 elections were, were, were California, right? Because as the mood of the people switches in communities, um, the, the districts are, are competitive. And, you know, after um, California, um, you saw a wave of reform, um, um, in part because California was a success, but also because gerrymandering was so aggressive after 2011, right? You know, in many states, people basically said, we can do whatever we want, um, because there was a feeling that the Supreme Court wasn't going to step in, and it hasn't stepped in, but you know, they, there was already a foreshadowing of that. And so people went to town. Um, and I will tell you, like, in states like Ohio, and I think this is also the case in Michigan, you know, it used to be people would talk about gerrymandering, they were talking about redistricting, and people's eyes would glaze over, right? And nobody cared about it. Um, but now, you know, if you look at polling, you say, like, we want to take power out of the hands of politicians, we want to, like, end gerrymandering, people are like, where do I sign up, right? I mean, it is just an issue that really resonates with people, because I think people feel the system is broken, and that um, redistricting has something of to do about it and that the political class um, rigs the process. And the amazing thing is um, you talk to people in Michigan, you talk to people in Ohio, they will say when they were collecting signatures, I went door to door in a mixed partisan neighborhood. I knocked on Republican doors, I knocked on Democratic doors. Everybody wanted to sign, right? You know, people are, you know, people don't like the political class, right? You know, um, and so, um, you know, there has been a trend toward doing redistricting better. The good news is that there's lots of models for it, right? You know, um, you know some of the earlier models you know, reform comes in waves, right? There was a, mob, a wave in the 60s and 70s, and then there was, you know, you had Arizona, and then you have California, um, and then this decade's, uh, or last decade's um, reforms, and, you know, they've gotten better, like people have learned from each other, so the process has gotten better, and, you know, this, this decade, when you see maps drawn in Michigan and Colorado, plus California, Arizona, I think, you know, they're, you're going to see much better results, and, and as a result, I think there's going to be an impetus for, for reform, at least where um, possible. And the, and the good news is that I, I do think um, it's increasingly becoming bipartisan in places like New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. Redistricting reform has had bipartisan support in the legislature. Um, it's been blocked in New Hampshire by the governor um, and in Pennsylvania by legislative leaders. Um, but, you know, it's increasingly bipartisan because I think people do, you know, it's a popular issue for voters. Politicians like issues that are popular with voters, um, but they also sort of, you know, get that, you know, it's a part of the problem, so. Thank you. If I could add really quickly, just in the most recent election cycle, there were over eight states that do have the ballot initiative process who all tried to get either a form of independent commission or redistricting reform. Because of the pandemic gathering signatures, things got complicated, so you didn't see as many states actually getting it onto the ballot, but huge amount of support and, and interest there as well. And I think, you know, the. One of the biggest differences is states that do have citizens with the ability to do it versus the legislature. 
to be looking out for their own interests. Although in Virginia, the legislature did uh, have a bipartisan agreement to change how they do redistricting, and the legislature is one who changed the process. Awesome. Uh, from the seventh congressional district, uh, Commissioner Bissonnette. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you. Thank you both for the information. Um, Katie, I have a question, and I appreciate that you, you know, I, I've spent a ton of time in the UP, and I appreciate that you, you made your comments about that. Um, what I'm wondering is, well, kind of two, two parts. It, it revolves around like uh, communities of interest. Mm -hmm. and what that looks like in the UP. And what I'm wondering is, um, like, uh, how did you define those? Or, or what was your feedback in, in that? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um, so for us, so our commission is actively, like they haven't started gathering direct feedback yet, okay. but we actually did gather feedback during our process. And uh, this is kind of a side note, but we had a competition where we invited citizens across the state to submit what they would have as their community of interest. And we had a group of quilters who like made a giant quilt. And on that part of Michigan, they would put what the community of interest was there. So I just thought that was great. Um, one was uh, definitely economics and the different kinds of populations. So whether it was mining or farming, um, we actually even heard about some breweries, some different fishing industries, a lot about kind of what cities and people are in what communities and how can we stay more together. The Upper Peninsula also has like a section, basically how it's gerrymandered right now is there's, there's certain colleges that are in the more highly populated parts of the Upper Peninsula. And you can clearly see where they're trying to like disrupt a college population so that they're in two districts instead of one. Um, and so we heard a lot of feedback about that too, of just kind of saying like, you know, where there are bigger cities, it makes no sense that you know, the very few big cities that are in the UP are actually cut into different districts. Um, one of the things for us as well that was just a big issue was the, the Upper Peninsula and the Lower Peninsula, um, where that line is drawn in the Lower Peninsula actually completely can negate the Upper Peninsula's voice. So there has been someone from the Upper Peninsula elected to the first congressional district in many years. And we heard tons about that, that like, if you don't actually live here, you have no real concept of, of our priorities and our needs. So that was another um, issue that we heard. Uh, and as well as there were some, there were some like environmental concerns just around um, like some of the communities that are more on the lake shore and just the development around lake shore and so coming. Well, if I could just add a follow up. Um, so um, were you getting feedback as far as like, um, you know, keeping counties whole or things like that, was that a pretty standard? It, um, in the UP, probably a little bit more than downstate, but for example, Lansing, which is our state capital, it is right in the middle of four counties. And so Lansing actually has four different congressional members, even though it's one of the largest cities in our state, which makes no sense to the people who live there. So like, you know, just because my neighbor lives over there, our kids go to the same school, why do we have to go to two different people to talk about the school reform we want? Like, and, and none of them want to pay attention to us enough because our city has been directed that way. Um, the Upper Peninsula, I think communities of interest was strong. Counties was a consideration, but actually like cities were more so because of some of those lines. The one part where it was different, which I don't I actually don't know enough about Wisconsin, I apologize. So in Michigan, there's two different time zones too. And so like part of the Upper Peninsula is in a different time zone. I'm not sure if that's the same in Wisconsin or not. But that actually was something that came up at one of the community meetings too, of just like, you know, even just being able to be organized and talk to each other, like it would be great to have that as a consideration. Yeah, I, I, I will just say like in some places around the country, like people do feel a really strong kindredness with their county, right? In some places in Texas, um, you know, it's like Smith County this, Smith County that, right? I mean, that's like your, that is your community, right? You think of yourself as a Smith County or um, in other places like New Jersey, you drive through 15 minutes and drive through three counties and you have no idea where you are, right? And so, you know, it just really depends. And, you know, I, I guess the, the ultimate thing I would say is like sometimes counties can be communities and sometimes they're just an administrative unit. So it, it just depends. And you, that's why you need to go talk to people about it and you know like in california when they did the community of interest testimony they ended up 
requiring people to do three things and I forgot what the third one was but um, the first is like you have to be able to define like the boundaries of your community like this is my community and then you have to be able to state um, why your what your community's representational interest is in other words like this is based on the environment this is based on the fact that we're all like this is working class or whatever it is and there's another one which is related to that but I, for, I forgot <laughs> what it is um and you have to be able to do that and that that helps people understand because again we all belong to different communities they overlap um um you know and you know and you know it's not possible to solve all of them so you have to decide which to prioritize I do know there was some discussion on our end on just like the way that our language was ended up being written. There's a lot of islands, not a lot, but there's a few islands um, that go in between the, the Upper Peninsula and Lower Peninsula. And so those islands technically will be kept with the county by default in our language. But that was just another kind of consideration when people were trying to think about that. And, um, and then like the geographic border of the literal bridge from Upper Peninsula to Lower Peninsula. I mean, that was a, a big thing that people brought up. It was just like a there's big differences and we want those respected. We want to have representation here. And it's great to get this kind of testimony, isn't it? I mean, it's just like, the, like you, like the fun thing about like restricting commissioners of California said that they loved it in part um, because they got to learn so much about the state, like just hearing about the state and hearing about communities and things like that. Kind of like, it's just um, amazing, like how the state actually works. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Princess. Yes, thanks, uh, Katie and Michael, both uh, for the information. Um, I guess my question would be directed at either one of you. I'm wondering, um, knowing that we have something of an uphill battle here uh, with our state legislature accepting our work, um, what advice do you have for, for the commission and, and for Wisconsin citizens as a whole for making sure that we put an end to partisan gerrymandering? <laughs> Um, I think, um, so especially with the work that this commission is doing, and because you are getting public testimony, making sure that that gets wrapped up and can become part of the public testimony for the hearings that will be held on the maps or the pro during the process of the maps when the legislature is drawing them, I think that's really important. Um, it not only provides an example, but it also then can literally provide like the, the evidence that people did show up and their voices were heard. One of the things that really surprised me, I think that surprised a lot of people in Michigan was because we had so many people involved in this process, um, there's like commission meetings of like the board of canvassers to get your petition approved. It's like very technical. And normally like two people show up to their meetings. Well, we showed up with 500 people and they were like, what are you doing? Like we didn't even know this many people knew who we were or that we exist. And it made people pay attention um, for the Michigan Supreme Court when our case was heard, uh, we were, there was a group trying to get us off the ballot, we stayed on, uh, but uh, it was the only day that the Michigan Supreme Court was filled was the day that they heard our case. And that's because it really did impact people and people wanted to have a say. They have seen, we're a very purple state in Michigan, you know, we have Democrats and we elect Republicans and what we consistently folks is that regardless of who's in power, it seems like there's a lot of core issues like water, infrastructure, our education system, that don't really change because our legislature isn't being cooperative enough, but it's also not being focused enough on what our communities need. And that's what people wanted. They, they, yeah, maybe they vote one way or the other, but they really just wanted representation. And so I think if you can turn people out, that's really exciting. And I think people being able to start, I think the communities of interest concept is helpful because you start thinking about what are the laws that aren't being prioritized right now that are actually really specific to my community. So we had a lot of local chambers of commerce who ended up endorsing us because um, they aren't the larger chamber of commerce, they're smaller businesses and a lot of their needs have gone unaddressed in our legislature. But they saw that if this process could change, hopefully they'd have more of a voice because the election process would require politicians to have to pay attention a little bit more to the needs of the community. Um, and so being able to show that bipartisan support, I mean, I, I know that I've seen, you know, so many counties in Wisconsin has already adopted like an, a, an advocacy at the county level for an independent commission. That's amazing. And so the more you can show that these are real people, this isn't just like a paid group to be here. These aren't just folks who um, are getting shipped in from another state. They're actual fellow citizens. I think it can have more of an impact, especially because people think like, oh, the redistricting process, nobody knows about that, nobody cares about it. But we do, a lot of us. 
Yeah, I, I, I would echo what Katie said. You know, I, you know, I, I recognize in some states it is easier to shame lawmakers into doing the right thing than in other states. And in some states, they seem fairly immune to like any kind of shame. Um, but, you know, the good news is that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, more people are paying attention to redistricting and to gerrymandering than ever before. Um, and that includes the media, right? I mean, you have a, a media that is much more savvy about writing about these issues. And historically, uh, redistricting was covered by the media with state house reporters. So they wrote about it as the state house issues, D's versus R's, you know, battle of the lawmakers, you know, um, and um, that's changed, right? I mean, I think that they understand, you know, some of the stories that, that you know, about how like, you know, um, and I, I expect like the public testimony that you get is going to have a lot of this, like our community is badly represented because of X, right? You know, and, and you know, um, you know, and, you know, and because we're split up or because, you know, what, what, whatever reason. Um, and those are good stories for the media to be able to tell. Um, it's also important as you produce a map that I guarantee you um, that um, because you are not starting off with, um, the end in mind necessarily, um, you know, unlike lawmakers who, when they draw the maps, will have the end in mind before they ever start. Um, your map will be better. It will look better. It will perform better. It will be better across a whole range of metrics, whether it's keeping, you know, ethnic communities, giving them a voice or, you know, keeping communities together. Um, and that's a, you know, a nice visual, right? Redistricting is hard to talk about, but you will have a nice visual to say like, hey, this is what they did. Here's what we did. And, you know, I suspect the media, I suspect most people will say, you know what, this actually does look better, right? Um, and sometimes it will be better in a, um, like, legally significant way. Like, you know, in Virginia, um, as you may know, a student drawn map was actually, um, you know, a, a map that won a student competition for, for the, the, the state house. Um, actually featured in litigation because the, the state of Virginia said, oh, well, yes, our map, you know, has bias in this way, you know, and, you know, you know, but it's only because we were trying to keep counties together, you know, this or that. Um, and the court was able to say like, no, 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 this student drew a map that what a competition and his map actually does better at that. And it doesn't have this like high bias. Um, so it kind of looks pretextual. Um, and so, um, you know, that's an example, you know, in, in the, out, you know, it's possible that something like that also happens in Wisconsin, um, you know, but, um, you know, so um, I, I wouldn't feel like this work is um, fruitless um, if for no other reason that it sort of helps build up, even if they don't take it, it will help build up the narrative about what they're doing and ultimately, you know, the tides do turn, right? And it's important to, you know, have this, um, out there because otherwise it, it will be like last time, which in Wisconsin was a closed door process where even Republican lawmakers didn't see the whole of the map, only they only saw their own district, right? You know, this you're shining sunlight on the process and, and um, that's amazing. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Ram. Um, thank you both. Uh, my question is for Katie. Would you mind taking us through the approach that you all use to determine the order, uh, the prioritization, and the weighting of the criteria? Yeah. That starts yeah, with so, the Voters so, Rights Act. Yep, totally. Yeah. And actually, Michael Lee helped facilitate us that way. Oh, He's been as a nonpartisan facilitator. But what we had done is we did a bunch of research on best practices and um, well, sorry, first we did those meetings across the state and really tried to see what do the people of Michigan want. We overwhelmingly heard representative maps that keep communities together, a system that is fair and equal for all political participations. They don't want more Democrats and Republicans being involved. Um, and one that is focused highly on impartiality, so not influenced from political uh, party members or people already in government as well as a transparent process that can be replicated and people can see that they, we didn't wanna to have to pay money to FOIA the results to see what kind of data was being used in the mapping process. And so then we held a summit together, um, trying to keep the, what the feedback from the community was in mind, looking at the constitutionality, and then Michael helped us walk through step-by-step what would it mean if you put this criteria over this criteria? So the reason we started with the constitutional criteria being number one was because that's the way the law works. If anything is found unconstitutional, it doesn't matter that we put it first or second. The federal constitution is going to take precedent over our um, constitution when it comes to those few things like the equal population and 
the Vo Voting Rights Act spells that. So that's why we put that there. We did contiguous next just because we didn't want any, it, it's also related to the existing law that we had, but uh, we also just didn't want any um, mistakes on the fact that like these districts actually have to touch. You can't have like a district that, that doesn't touch for 70 miles. Uh, and so then we started with communities of interest because we had heard so much feedback around how not everybody thinks of county as, it, it really was mostly about the county conversation actually, that not everybody would define their community as county, that school district is maybe more important, but even beyond that, just some of those cultural um, elements they've found would be more important. And in other parts of the state, they definitely thought that like existing county lines or city lines were more important. Um, but in order to balance that, those folks who live in those different counties could go and give public testimony saying, hey, our community would be defined by this, please draw the lines that way. But if we had switched the order of those criteria, and Michael, you can probably articulate this better than me. If we had switched that though, the default would be, you have to start with any existing boundary. You have to start with the county lines. And then if there's like too much population in that area, then you could consider a community of interest. But if there isn't, then it has to get default to that existing boundary line. And that's why we're like, that's not, that was just wasn't the feedback we were hearing from people. We were really hearing that these cultural elements um, more important, and especially in larger cities too, like Detroit is going to be split up into more than one congressional district. And if that line has to be drawn somewhere, what's going to take precedence? School district, or should it be like the community neighborhood talking about it and what they want? Um, right. We then put uh, basically making gerrymandering illegal as the next one that, you know, you can't have any kind mm -hmm. of um, political bias related to incumbents or existing political parties. Um, I don't I, I think it was mostly that um, we definitely wanted that to be high on the list, but for practicality reasons, it just kind of came in the middle. Um, and uh, and then we ended with, we do have a, a rule about relatively contiguous. One of the reasons why is we have some districts that are just, they have been drawn extremely narrow and to even drive from one part of the district to the bottom takes hours and hours. And so practically even for people running for office, it makes it very hard. You have to be pretty much very wealthy to already be able to even and compete in a district. And so that was another important piece. Came at the end because from the feedback we were hearing, communities, being able to keep a school district together, existing boundaries was also really important. And although like, you know, people still thought it was important that districts were kept together, but but not that it should take precedent over some of those other issues and interests. Right. I mean, you know, just to add a little bit of gloss to what Katie said, I mean, I, I you know, um, you know, there, there was some resistance to communities of interest from some quarters because, you know, people feel like that, that opens the door to manipulation, right? You know, and it's mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, well, like, you know, you'll just define a community based on something that like ultimately really serves your political goals. Um, and, you know, what they realized, um, over time is, you know, like first of all, getting a lot of in input that communities were important to the people of Michigan. But secondly, there were a lot of checks and balances, like the way that you pass a map, you can't do it on party line basis and stuff like that. So there were a lot of checks and balances to make sure that like, you know, Republicans were gonna like have the ball and be able to define communities in the way that they wanted, right? You had to get some other support to pass a map. And so there, it's the way the commission worked is that there are lots of checks and balances and that they felt comfortable at the end going with communities because it would be a collective decision, right? You know, not one party's decision over the other. Um, but initially there was a lot of impetus from people wanting to like do like um, compactness above all else. Um, and there was discussion about how like sometimes Michigan communities aren't compact, right? You know, school districts aren't compact, you know, black communities aren't necessarily compact, right? You know, it's sort of like, you know, do you really want extreme compactness? Um, but I remember one debate about competitiveness and, you know, like many times people want to have competitiveness in there. Um, but then there was a realization that sometimes to make districts competitive, you actually have to gerrymander because like sometimes districts are very Republican or very Democratic, right? You know, like Detroit is going to be Democratic, right? You know, and like places in West Texas are going to be Republican and you, you should gerrymander to try to make a district competitive. I, re I remember one point somebody said, um, and I won't mention any names or anything, but like, every district should be like 50-50. And it's like, well, like 
you'd have an extreme gerrymander to get every district in Michigan 50-50. But secondly, if there's like a swing toward Republicans in one year, like they would win every single district. You really want a legislature that's 100% Republican, you know, or 100% Democratic, right? You know, like you, you actually want the legislature to look like the people as a whole to go back to Adams. And the way to do that is really a powerful tool is community, so. Thank you. Mr. Ringo. Yeah, uh, thank you both. Um, uh, yep, uh, sorry, I'm just kind of, I got a few questions here. Um, thank you both, very informative. Um, I'm really thinking about the level of transparency to our process. I think, I mean, all of our meetings are, are public and, and everything's available online, but I'm more so concerned about like uh, the intersection of transparency and publicity almost. Uh, Katie, I looked at the, the Michigan like Facebook page and Twitter and, you know, they have over a thousand uh, followers and likes on both respectively. And so um, we, we don't have any sort of social media presence. So I guess my question could be for Katie or Michael, uh, but Katie, we can start with you related to transparency. What are some of the um, like best practices or promising practices uh, in addition to what you've already talked about, uh, even into specifics like I don't know if you know like who runs the social media account. All of us on the on the commission here are volunteers. Uh, some of us have uh, additional you know full time jobs, and so um, uh, I, I guess any information you can give or advice you can give around transparency and publicity and how we make sure the people of Wisconsin know the work that's happening um, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, so the art commission is kind of housed in the Secretary of State's office. So they're, they technically have gotten them started, although one of the first things that the commission is doing is, is trying to hire some staff for the commission. I know that it's different because ours is like a, an official in the constitution body. So like there's a certain amount of our budget that we guaranteed that commission could have to do their services. Um, one of the things that I think, you know, you guys are a body and an official body and, um, the census, you know, is happening. It's obviously related to your work very strongly. And a lot of cities um, and municipalities pay attention to the census because they get money allocated from the census results. And so you may want to consider actually like writing a letter officially as the commission inviting um, public officials to make sure their communities turn out when you're going to be in their district or something like that. We as volunteers raising awareness for our commission did that. We found every municipality in Michigan that had over 3,500 people and we just wrote letters as you know a group of citizens saying, hey, we're going to be taking input on this constitutional language. We want to make sure your voices heard show up. And it's interesting, a lot of the bigger cities completely ignored us, but especially a lot of the smaller cities that normally don't have a lot of um, people asking for their input, we had standing room only meetings. Like, like in a city where there was a total population of a thousand people, we had 80 people on a Saturday, which is like, it, and we weren't an, a previously established organization or anything like that. So sometimes actually just like making sure you're asking delivers a lot. Um, I know that there's a lot of really great groups, good governance groups in Wisconsin. I actually um, got to, uh, attend a meeting in the middle of Wisconsin that had 400 citizens who were passionate about this. And, and seeing that those county boards have been passing a recommendation for an independent commission, maybe there's a way to like send a letter even to the folks who were helping pass that or to those county commissioners to let them know when you're gonna be in their district so that they could give their input since they've already kind of weighed and thought about this, just an, just an idea. Um, and I know this, I think this is being ran through the governor's office. I'm, I know that they have media people. So you might just wanna, ask. I'm sure everybody's got limited capacity, but again, you're, you guys should be a priority. It's a very exciting thing. Maybe ask if you can be added as one of those channels. And, you know, my thought would be they won't want to put out the direct words for you because they're not trying to have bias in what you do. But if you did want to agree on some things like we want, you know, at least 48 hours before every meeting, a link with the application or the link to like give public comment and people to know about this, like maybe you could set up some standard rules that way. Um, and uh, and anything you can do about what the topic's going to be and where you're going to be and just especially letting those advocacy groups know, like, you know, there's a fair map group, but even like League of Women Voters, there's lots of different civic organizations where people come and meet. Um, not all of them maybe will know redistricting is applicable to them, but some will. And uh, 
And it's amazing to see that once you actually give people the chance to have an opinion, how many people do. I know in California, when we were talking to their commissioners, they would have sometimes like a five hour line for people waiting to come and talk to them because for the first time ever, they were actually being asked about what representation could look like in their community. And it's such a powerful gift that you get to give your fellow um, Wisconsinites. And, uh, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't downplay that. Local I, news, I, Austin, will like, I'm sure they'd love to interview you guys too. You'd want to make sure that you have like a set of talking points and that you do and don't want to say, don't violate any public media rules that you might have put in place. But I mean, we, when we would go to different communities, we'd, you know, just send the news a media alert saying, here's, you know, what we'll be talking about the discussion and who we're hoping will turn out and why. I have nothing to add to that. Katie is the extraordinary organizer and you could see like why everything got done in Michigan because like she's just like thinking like through it on on the go so. awesome yes thank you um uh, commissioner mcclellan hi thanks and thanks to the speakers and um Jason, Commissioner Bisonet, I will tell you now, you asked the questions that I was going to ask. So um, I think that it's very interesting about the communities of interest and how they um, are prioritized above um, the city, county, and town. Um, and growing up in Detroit and living in Michigan for at least through my 20s, um, maybe because it was a big town. Wayne County was like nothing, right? Oakland County, nothing. It was the city where you lived in is what you associated with. But now living here in Wisconsin, and um, I've only lived in this Western Wisconsin, which is more of a rural environment, but counties are huge. Like our county supervisors um, like a lot of input, the county government for um, local control is um, very important. So I think it's something that you're right, you just have to kind of weigh it in the community that you're in and um, you know, figure it out. It, it's not a straightforward uh, one size fits all. Um, but so since Jason asked my question, now I have another one. <laughs> this is um, from Michael Lee. I don't know if you can comment on the role of the courts um, with redistricting now. I mean, everything, we are an advisory commission. Um, our maps may or may not be taken into account. Um, the courts have in the past, I think all but once in, I don't know what, 40 or 50 years, the courts have drawn the maps for Wisconsin have been involved in the final drawing of it. Um, do you think that they are losing their enthusiasm for having to take on this role? And is there anything that they could do to promote um, commissions or try to break this continuous cycle that we find ourselves in? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question, um, you know, because there are a number of places, including Wisconsin, where courts oftentimes draw maps. Um, and, you know, how they do that, you know, is something that they oftentimes sort of, the procedure that they use oftentimes is very, you know, improvised, right? You know, they sort of like look for precedent a little bit because they're lawyers and that's what we do as lawyers. We look for like the past to get the present. Um, but, you know, so, you know I, I do think like there are opportunities to have a much more open and robust process, right? One that is not quite so much like a judicial hearing, um, but, you know, um, you know, involves like, public input or hearings or, you know, and, you know, it, perhaps appointing a special master to go and like take into account, you know, public testimony or things like that. Um, and, you know, I would look to Minnesota. I realize that that's sometimes a fraught thing to say uh, to people in Wisconsin to say, look at Minnesota. Um, but, you know, in Minnesota, there was a deadlock in 2011, um, you know, because of the, you know, the, the governor and the legislature couldn't agree on a map. And so, court stepped in and they, they, you know, adopted an order that said, okay, we're going to get testimony. People are going to submit maps and we're going to try to like run this as, you know, um, almost like a quasi commission, not quite like a commission, you know, we're still a court. Um, but that's very different than in some places where it just like, um, oh, well, the, you know, the legislative leaders get to submit a map, the governor gets to submit a map and that's it. Right. You know, and everybody else, unless you're maybe like a minority group, you're sort of shut out. Right. You know, like under very strict, 
rules about who gets to participate. Um, and I do know, like the Wisconsin Supreme Court is considering, you know, what they're going to do. You know, the the, the um, there was an effort to sort of like really limit like who could participate in a dispute before the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Um, and I know they're they're weighing that, but you know, like having a more open process, like in Minnesota or some other states, um, what you know I think can be helpful, right? You know, and especially since you know this time, um, you know, we conceivably will have a little bit more. You know, it remains to be seen how the, the schedule works out, but you know, there's conceivably a little bit more time um, in the, the joints, and so um, you know, I, I would look to, you know, I I would encourage courts not to be bound by what they've done in the you know, in the past and just view this as a quick, you know, okay, we've got to rule fast and let's just see what the parties do and we'll pick one, right? Because that's a recipe for, you know, you're just going to get gerrymandered maps from everybody and they're going to say, okay, we'll do that. But the good news is I do think like you guys will have a huge voice because you will have a, you know, a, a map that's based on public participation and isn't drawn by political leaders and things like that. And so you know, I, I think that that is a huge opportunity for you guys. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Anthony? Yeah, um, you both did great presentations and answered many questions um, that I had about how we might need to fashion our approach. Um, but um, given the fact that you have um, presentation or you have um, processes that are much more evolved than what uh, we're doing here in Wisconsin, are there any shortcomings to uh, the approaches that you are using that you might say, um, even though we're doing this, there's something else we need to do. Uh, there's one or two more steps that we need to take uh, to make this model that we're currently using better. And I first would uh, propose that to Katie and then secondly to uh, Michael. Really interesting. Um, so our commission is in place now and this is their first time around. And so I think afterwards, we'll, I'll probably have a much more informed opinion on what we missed or didn't miss. I'd love to think we thought of everything, but also because we were doing a constitutional amendment, you don't wanna shove every single tiny rule in the constitution that really should be more legislative or up for the commission to decide. One of the things we didn't think about um, was what if the world shuts down in the pandemic? And we put a lot of strict deadlines in our constitutional language because we knew one of the ways that sometimes uh, the legislature will kick the can is by either doing things at the last minute or prolonging deadlines. And we wanted that, we were trying to proactively prevent against that. Um, I think they've been able to navigate it okay so far, but for example, something that you guys are doing right now, you know, technically you're having a district meeting. I think this, um, uh, was it seven? Today is seven, maybe? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, our commission's also required to go and do like 10 meetings in 10 different locations around the state. I don't know what, I, you know, it, because it's in the constitution, they have to, but what that means, what that looks like, it'll be interesting to see. And uh, the other part of it is with less traditional in-person public meetings, um, there is there are some folks that don't have reliable internet access. Uh, some folks in Michigan don't even have running water. And so how do you actually make sure those communities aren't forgotten and their voices can still be heard, especially because in this first year of us doing it, making sure people can actually trust this process and trust that it was done with the intention that it had. I, I, I hope the commission figures it out and maybe we could have to more proactively think about ways to, to encourage them to do that. Um, but up until this point, yeah, I, I don't have too much, but in a year I could I could let you know. Thank you. Um, I The only advice I would have, I think is something I alluded to earlier, which is, um, you know, in California, they found it ultimately very helpful to help people like tell, in other words, people will come and they will want to testify, um, but you know, they've never done it before. They don't know what it is that they, you know, um, should say, or, you know, sometimes they've never done anything like this before, they're nervous. And so, um, you know, in California, they had like very specific questions, um, for example, around community user interest, like, tell me what the boundaries are, tell me, you know, like what, what it is. And, and people found, the commissioners found the information they got um, very useful. Um, I think it also was easier for people to like take it in bite-sized chunks to know, okay, this is what they're they're asking for. I can answer that rather than having to come up with like this whole grand statement or something like that, right? And I, I, I have attended lots of redistricting hearings in many different states. And like sometimes people just get up and they filibuster because they don't know what they're supposed to say, right? And so, um, you know, helping them know what they're supposed to answer, what you're looking for, 
um, I think can be key. Um, and you know, having that in written form, um, you know, perhaps allowing them to fill it, fill out a form online, right? You know, just sort of say like, here I am, and like here, I'm answering your five questions. Um, you know, that will be, that will be key. Um, and you know, um, that's not that dissimilar to what. Um, Asian American groups did in New York City. You know, they went in Queens. They went around and surveyed people, and they had a survey asking them what their communities were. Um, and they had to put boundaries on, and you know, and they had to answer a number of questions. And ultimately, they were able to put produce like layered maps. Right? Not everybody's sense of community was the same, but they kind of like layered on top of like the the parts of you know the neighborhoods in Queens, and you can kind of see like, okay, everybody agrees that this core part is part of our community, right? And you know, they might disagree on the edges, but everybody agrees the core part is. And then they were able to layer that on top of like existing maps, and they could see, oh, our community split into like five different assembly districts, right, or five different city council districts. And and that was like really powerful. And it wasn't like a collaborative thing, like people weren't doing this at the same time, They but they were able to gather information and they were able to say, ah, like there's a lot of, um, you know, similarities. Um, you also, like, I've also heard that some people are increasingly, um, and Moon Duchin at, at, out of Tufts um, in the Boston area, um, you know, for the testimony there, um, recording it orally and they're like doing heat maps right so some certain words come up a lot you know like environment or you know like factory or something like that right and so you start to see like what people are talking about right you know and it's sort of like oh well we got a sense of like here it's about the factory right or here it's about the school or here it's about you know like um, the cuban and community or something like that right and you get to see like what people care about right and so i know that they're doing something you might reach out to uh, a moon duchin at tufts university to see if they could help you with some of that so and michael mm -hmm. you just made me think of one of the pieces of advice that the when we were talking to some of the commissioners who have done this before um they had a shared understanding of like what kind of criteria they would set for like what issues when people bring them up from the community are applied to congressional districts and what's really more a senate district or a, an in-state house district because some regulations, so an example in Michigan is one of our congressional districts, the airport uh, is actually <laughs> split in half and it's represented by two different congressmen. Well, it, Congress can vote on federal airline regulations and pieces like that. So our congressman actually in that area said, you know, I represent half an airport, but when talking about the redistricting process, and like that would probably apply to something that's under their jurisdiction compared to other issues that are more handled at the state level. So. That was just some advice of like early on them trying to get a shared understanding of how might they like file some of the feedback they were forgetting for communities because not everything was relevant to all three sets of lines. Okay, thank you. All right, guys, I think we have time uh, for one last question. So uh, Commissioner Tobias. Thank you. And thank you, um, Katie and Michael. Really appreciate the great information. So my question is for Katie. Um, in um, in your slide deck, what underlying drawing process, for so transparency, and it had included um, public observation and participation. So the participation piece, aside from um, public comments, you know, your public hearing and um, submitting their own maps, was there anything else that, um, that you included in that? Yeah, yeah, and I'll, um, like I said, I'll share the PowerPoint. So the constitutional language, it, it's not actually that long, but so public comment as well as observation. And the way that we interpreted observation was like, how can the public hold you as a commission accountable? Because there's so many people who just don't trust anything right now. They don't trust commissions, they don't. So even before you have, even have your first conversation, they're gonna be skeptical of what you guys created. And so what that meant was making the data that's used for drawing the maps, publicly available. Um, for selecting our commissioners, I think our Secretary of State did an awesome job modeling this. So we had 10,000 people who applied to be commissioners and we have a lottery that chooses them. And the lottery is done through a computer program. We actually like live streamed the person who like designing how the lottery we would be done, showing the exact like background information. And I, you know, I don't know computer coding very well. So to me, I was kind of like, yeah, that sounds great. But people could, you know, if somebody did know, <laughs> Look, fishy. They could have, like, in the moment, actually been saying something and being like, "Why did you do that?" or have a question on the integrity of it. And then they actually showed, like, the computer, like, running the program and what numbers were chosen. They, you know, some public, some private information on like phone numbers and stuff like that. But they had the application links, and you could watch and you could see that. 
And then they had the public comment tied with that. And then they made the file publicly available afterwards so that people could actually go in and see it. And it might also be because I'm like, I'm a millennial and I grew up with computers and the internet, but like just knowing I can do that feels so much better than almost any other government process that happens right now, where even if I wanted to go double check, I can't. There's like a bunch of firewalls or if they never put it online or whatever. And so those elements were also put in. We had a, um, I don't know that it's as relevant to you guys, but it might be. One of the other things is just for our, our commissioners couldn't actually talk about their official work outside of a public meeting, um, or they couldn't meet with like more than, uh, I can't, it's in the actual language, but I think like, you know, like two or three people can like chat, but it can't be about a public uh, business and all of that. And that's just, in Michigan, that tends to be an option for any public hearings. Our public hearing laws are not really followed. Our FOIA laws are like, really at discretion. And so there's a lot of people who, again, have a lot of distrust for any kind of system with that. And by reinforcing that and making it stronger, being proactive about that, that sort of helped add to it as well. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks uh, to the commission for asking uh, the questions and thanks for our presenters for coming out and speaking to us. You know, I feel like uh, you know, we get a lot of good information here, especially to kind of help us in going forward and creating some of our criteria and, and kind of uh, applying it. So we hope, um, you know, that, that you keep an eye on what we're doing and we'll definitely do the same for you guys. And uh, hopefully, you know, we can reach out to you in the future as well if any other questions should pop up. So thank 100%. you guys for doing this. Yeah, yeah. thank you thank guys. Thank you so much. Your you're helping restore trust to, to the process and it's so needed and welcomed. And I've already heard all the excitement from people. So thank you for your service. Awesome guys, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. All right, so I'll pass it over to, uh, to Molly at this time. We will now begin approximately one hour of public testimony. The individuals testifying tonight registered ahead of tonight's meeting. As a reminder to tonight's testifiers, this hearing is recorded and is being live streamed. Each individual will have three minutes to testify to the commission. To ensure the maximum amount of time, the uh, maximum numbers of the public can address the commission members, the commission members will not answer any questions or provide any comments following individual's testimony. This is a similar practice that legislative committees such as the Legislative Committee on Joint Finance follows. Finally, as a reminder, if any members of the public would like to provide feedback or comments to the Commission at any point throughout the tenure of the People's Maps Commission initiative, you are encouraged to submit written comments through the public comment form that is available on wisconsin.gov forward slash people's maps. The first individual testifying this evening is Bob Maline from the 7th Congressional District. Bob? Hi there. My name is Bob Maline. I live in Hudson. I'm a lifelong independent voter. In fact, 23 years ago, I was Jesse Ventura's campaign treasurer. I think this works best if I put myself in your shoes. So for the next three minutes, I'll be the 10th member of your commission. We, might, we only have one real question before us. What priorities do we give to the map modelers that we'll work with? For me, the answer is clear. We have got a toxic, cultural and political divide in this country and this state. We've got to find ways to bridge this gap. And I agree there's no one political solution, but there is a way to take a little bit of fuel off the fire right here, right now. Our highest priority should be to have the statewide legislative makeup mirror the various party preferences of the statewide electorate. That is, if 52% of the assembly votes are cast for party A, then party A should have 52% of the re representatives in the assembly. And if I'm not mistaken, this is exactly what Katie referred to as symmetry in her presentation. Other important objectives will still be included in the model, but at a lower priority. And no, this alone won't solve our cultural division, but it's the only plan that has a chance of gaining trust from all sides. And trust is exactly what we're missing right now. Our goal should be to approximate as closely as possible the cumulative party preference across the state. You might think this is obvious, but it is not. We've grown to accept the fact that districts are winner take all. So small deviations create huge distortions in the legislature. 
There are methods to address this that are far beyond the scope of this, comp this commission. But the most important thing is set the priority first. Set the priority so that the, we make the legislature mirror the statewide electorate. Tell the map modelers to make their estimates for opposition votes in the many uncontested elections in the state. Have them run their 100,000 models and then choose the models that, that meet that criteria and select from those the other criteria that we need, the, the legal criteria, the, the other criteria, including Voting Rights Act, competitiveness, or communities of interest. We have a chance to actively lower the heat that's dividing our country right now and still meet important legal and community issues if we do this right. I strongly urge the commission to foster a legislature that mirrors the statewide electorate. Thank you so much for all your time and your effort on this. Good night. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. The next individual is Ann Stevening Rowe from the 7th Congressional District. Ann? Uh, my name is Ann Stevening Rowe. I reside in Marshfield, Wood County in the 7th CD. Our municipality of 19,000 people was divided between two assembly districts and two state Senate districts since 2011. Our county of 74,000 people was divided into four assembly districts, three state Senate districts, and two congressional districts since 2011. Before 2011, Marshfield and most of Wood County were in one assembly district, one state Senate district, and one congressional district. That is why I became uh, one of the plaintiffs in Whit the Whitford case. The Constitution of Wisconsin requires that districts be bounded by county, precinct, town, or ward lines, consist of contiguous territory, and be as compact as practical. The 2011 redistricting divided our small municipality between two assembly districts and two state senate districts. Assembly District 86 goes from the eastern district of, Wisconsin, of Marshfield up through Marathon County and is inconsistent with those constitutional requirements. State Senate District 29 stretches from the eastern part of Marshfield through Wausau and up through Russ County and into Sawyer County and Hayward where Jason uh, Bisonet is. That also violates those constitutional principles. The western part of Marshfield is in State Senate District 93. It meanders west through Chippewa Falls into Dunn County. This is not a community of interest for Marshfield and Wood County. Before 2011, Assembly District 70 consisted of most of Wood County and our Assembly Representative and State Senator were part of our community of interest. Since the 2011 redistricting, most people in Marshfield don't even know who their State Senators are because they don't come here. To my knowledge, we have not seen our State Senators since 2011. In 2018, Assembly Seat 69, which is my district, was unopposed. In 2020, Assembly District 86 was unopposed. Uncompetitive districts disenfranchise the voters and they perceive that there's no use in voting. In 2011, the southern part of Wood County was cracked from the seventh CD and packed with Stevens Point into the third CD where their votes are wasted and the seventh CD became less competitive. Nonpartisan redistricting should be fully transparent with public hearings instead of computerized maps manipulating the population be behind closed doors. I ask the commission to propose maps that will fairly redistrict the state adhering to the constitutional pr principles and also traditional redistricting principles of the preservation of communities of interest. I ask that we return Wisconsin to a state where the voters choose their representatives instead of the party. If you, um, for those, and not just Anne, for those of you who um, uh, have set testimony beyond the three minutes, we would encourage you to still um, submit your testimony through the wisconsin.gov slash people's maps so that we still have your testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. The next individual we have is Kim Butler from the 7th Congressional District. Kim? Oh, there you 
you are, Kim. Yep. You can go ahead whenever you're ready. Me, Kim? Yep, Kim, yep. Oh. Oh, all right. I'm next. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Um, thank you, commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Kim Butler from Balsam Lake on the west side of the state, and I am uh, chair of the 7th Congressional District Democratic Party. I'm chair of Polk County Democrats, and I am a two-time candidate for uh, State Assembly District 28. Um, since the 7th CD was redistricted in 2011, we have had five congressional elections. Every one of them resulted in the Republican candidate garnering about 60% of the vote and the Democratic candidate getting roughly 40%. It didn't matter how much money the Democrat raised or didn't, how hard they worked or how appealing a candidate they were. This is in a district the Democratic Congressman Dave Obi won 20 times and served in for over 40 years. I'm not denying that our district has become more conservative but the fact that uh, there's been this consistency in recent voting totals is not something that's happened by accident. Never was this more evident than the past election when Tom Tiffany, a very conservative anti-environmentalist, won against Trisha Zunker, a local woman with deep ties to the area who raised over a million dollars and ran a tight professional campaign. Trisha was one of the hardest working candidates that we've seen, and yet she still only got 43% of the vote. When the seventh was redistricted, they eliminated university towns, including Stevens Point and parts of the UW Eau Claire area. These towns tend to vote more democratic. In 2011, the Hill published a list of the top 10 house members helped by redistricting and former seventh CD Congressman Tom, um, Sean Duffy ranked seventh on that list. The size of the district is now enormous. It was previously 17 full and three partial counties for a total of 20. Now it's 21 full and five partial counties for a total of 26 counties. This large of a district makes campaigning and political organizing difficult, and it makes it hard for the congressional representative to have meaningful public contact with their constituents. Splitting counties um, into districts at times is unavoidable as people have mentioned, but almost 20% of the counties in the seventh are split. And that goes against the Wisconsin constitution requirements that districts be compact and follow geographic and municipal lines. Split districts confuse voters and make it harder for both parties to campaign and organize. Um, I failed twice in my bid for state assembly and my district here um, spans three counties. Now, one of those counties, I have only one township and they have removed um, towns from um, along the border of uh, the county that I reside in, Polk County, and given me about um, half of the Northern County. But why there is one town in St. Croix County that is in the 28th district and then three other assembly districts represent that county. So four assembly districts for one um, county. Um, oh, am I done already? Yeah, that was three minutes. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The next individual we have is Anne Chartier from the 7th Congressional District. Anne? Good evening. Uh, my name is Anne Chartier. I live near the shores of Lake Superior in Ashland, and I'm a retired public school teacher. I believe our democracy can work to guarantee human rights for all. I am thankful for this opportunity to listen to the presentations and the questions and to participate in this uh, uh, People's Maps Commission hearing for the 7th Congressional District. I am aware of the impressive credentials of the nine commission members and that you were selected by three judges, two of whom were initially appointed by governors of both of the major parties. I appreciate your commitment to this very important issue. And I thank the Evers administration for laying out this process that could make it possible for Wisconsin to finally have voting districts that are fairly drawn using all the tools that are presently available. I address you this evening primarily to express my sincere appreciation for the work you are doing to support the governor's effort to make sure districts are not designed to favor 
any particular party, but rather are based on the number of people living in each county and the municipalities within them. It has been fascinating to learn the history behind our current gerrymandered situation. You have an important task ahead. My job is to spread the word about how important what you are doing is in order to get Wisconsinites to demand that our legislators pay heed to your recommendation. The map you come up with may look like a puzzle with strange shaped pieces, but the goal is a map drawn on based on population and municipal boundaries rather than attempts to crack and pack voters to predetermine the outcome of an election even before votes are cast. You are the experts who will be responsible for producing an alternative to what we have. Following the footsteps of Bayfield County that passed a referendum in favor of fair maps in November, I am very pleased that Ashland County where I vote will have a similar referendum on the ballot this coming April. I'm hoping Wisconsinites will loudly voice their support for the map you create so that the legislature will embrace it wholeheartedly. That way, at least when it comes to voting districts, partisanship will be a thing of the past. Thanks again for the work you are doing and for this opportunity to speak out in support of it. Thank you, Ann. The next individual we have is Tom Sklabar from the 7th Congressional District. Tom, you are on mute, Tom. Good evening, my name is Tom Sklebar. I live up in Iron River, Wisconsin. I'm part of the 7th Congressional District in Bayfield County. Um, I had originally applied to serve on this particular commission because of my own area of expertise of three decades of working with geographic information systems. I've already served on federal and statewide geographic data committees and written programs similar to what you're using for redistricting. Processing census data is fairly straightforward, but my real concern for the commission when using GIS to draw these boundaries is the criteria and rules being used without adequate discussion and rule selection along with a full understanding of how they work in a GIS, the process, and therefore the outcome can become tainted by opinion and politics. My position on the People's Map Commission is simple. Redistricting should be an open, transparent process to the public. Any redistricting should have a clear and transparent methodology and criteria. Any redistricting should also ensure that the weight of any one person vote in any one location of the state is equal weight to every other person's vote. In Bayfield County, 77% of our county residents voted in favor of the nonpartisan procedure in the most recent election. Uh, previously, we also know that 51 of 72 counties have also passed a similar resolution. Now is the time for Wisconsin to move to a clear and transparent redistricting in full view of the public with observers with a fully nonpartisan commission. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. The next individual is Hans Breton Moser from the seventh congressional district. Hi there, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, well, yeah, my name is Hans Breiton Moser. I'm from Lincoln County, that's North Central Wisconsin. I'm a dairy farmer. I'm also on the Lincoln County Board of Supervisors. Um, and I certainly appreciate uh, having the opportunity to talk with you folks. And I, I also very much appreciate um, your service on this very important board. Um, I, I don't think that I have a whole lot to offer that hasn't been offered already. I think you guys have been uh, at this long enough where you've heard quite a bit of input and are hearing the same things again and again, but I felt it was important to to um, pile on here because I think it shows that local uh, officials and um, you know just Joe and Jane Q public are um, understand that we have a problem and um, 
and understand that it's time that we get it fixed. I was part of the movement that got a resolution passed in Lincoln County and, and uh, also had we had a referendum in Lincoln County. And, and, and at that time in the fall of 2018, even though um, we voted for Republicans up and down the ballot, 65% of those same voters voted for a nonpartisan procedure uh, because we, we understand that we need a system that gives us that one person, one vote. And we understand that uh, having political party bosses in charge of drawing these lines is a perversion of our representative democracy. So we need to get away from that. And I think this commission is the way to do it in terms of what needs to be done, done and how that sausage needs to be made. The fact that we're having this meeting right now gives me all sorts of hope that the maps that you guys create are going to be a far superior product than anything that we've seen in the past because we've got the transparency and you're looking, sincerely looking for input uh, from those of us who are close to the ground. This isn't rocket science. I don't believe that this is terribly complicated. You need to keep the things compact, contiguous and follow existing political boundaries and keep communities of interest intact to the best of your ability. I, I don't see that as um, so horribly, terribly complicated. Um, I think it's very, very doable. And I, and I have every confidence that we can come up with a good product. Uh, you know, again, transparency is key. If people can see how things are being done, um, that gives uh, the people confidence and hopefully they'll give people enough confidence that they will uh, call their legislators and, and tell them that the People's Maps Commission create are the maps that we should be using because just by, by looking at them, we'll be able to, uh, I think, see how superior they are compared to the maps that we have now that are so long and obviously split, split communities of interest and, and sort of go all over the board. Um, so I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Hans. The next yeah. individual is Jen Bizzato from the 7th Congressional District. Jen? Good evening, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Awesome. Hello, my name is Jen Bizzotto. I live here in Wausau, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm on the Marathon County Board of Supervisors, although I should say that my comments tonight reflect solely my own views. Um, but I wanted to start off by thanking this commission for all of the hard work that you're doing and all of the many, many documents and presentations that you're reading through and listening to respectively. And thank Governor Evers for having this commission in the first place. Um, I, I want to echo a lot of what I've been hearing up to this point, you know, especially Hans's comments about we, we know where we want to go and we'll figure out how we get there in the details. Um, I also wanted to, to say that someone else me mentioned Trisha Zunker, who just run for, ran for the seventh uh, congressional dis state legislative district. And I just wanted to say, like, as a, a young person um, interested in politics, um, it, it's incredibly frustrating to watch people um, bust their butt like Trisha Zunker and, and lose because um, it's incredibly difficult to win given the makeup of the districts. And so I just wanted to put that perspective out there of like the people who are being discouraged from running um, from districts being like this. So I just wanted to voice my you know, full-throated support for re redistricting in, the, in ways that people tonight who are much smarter than I am have uh, outlined, like making the legislature mirror the votes, um, having voters uh, pick the representatives, not the other way around. Um, I do want to say in a message of hope on my way out that the Marathon County Board passed a resolution supporting a nonpartisan redistricting process last July, and um, I'm, I'm very proud of our board for doing that, and I'm very hopeful that things will change for the better in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. The next individual is Roger Utenheimer from the 7th Congressional District. Roger? Hey, well, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Roger Utenheimer from Wausau, and I speak to you as a 20-year member of the Board of Wisconsin Common Cause and also a recently retired broadcaster who owned stations that included Antigo, Eagle River, and Park Falls. Now, I had the good fortune of working for a Wisconsin political icon, State Senator Tiny Krieger of Merrill, while a student at the University of Wisconsin. Working for Tiny Krieger gave me an insight into the legislative process at its best, an era when elected officials won on the strength of their ideas, not the gerrymandering of their district. Those were better times. 
Fair Maps is a good news, bad news story. Bad news because Wisconsin elections are rigged. Rigged because of how legislative districts are mapped to protect incumbents and the party in power. Proof that Wisconsin elections are rigged is that Democratic candidates for legislative races in 2020 received 47% of the votes and only 38% of the seats. In 2018, 53% of the votes and 36% of the seats. 2016, Democratic candidates got 48% of total votes and only 35% of seats. That is simply not fair. Elections are rigged because elected officials are selecting their voters instead of allowing voters to select their elected officials. Bad news is that Wisconsin taxpayers are spending millions of dollars on attorney fees, more than $4 million related to the 2011 reapportionment alone. Good news is that we only have to look to our neighbors in Iowa for a fair, effective, respected, and inexpensive manner to draw legislative maps. Although our friends in Iowa may consider the telephone pole to be their state tree, Iowa is a national model on how to map legislative districts. They are adopted in a nonpartisan process. Districts are contiguous, general elections are competitive, and the cost is near nothing. Components include having the equivalent of the Legislative Reference Bureau draw the maps, not politicians concerned with perpetuating power. Iowa's model precludes drawing boundaries to benefit one party or a specific incumbent. Common Cause endorses the Iowa model. We encourage the People's Map Commission to adopt it and the Wisconsin legislature to pass it. Iowa may not have many trees, but they sure get how to draft legislative maps right. It's time for Wisconsin to follow Iowa and once again elect candidates on the strength of their ideas, not the gerrymandering of their districts. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, sir. The next individual we have is Janelle Ludwig Krause from the 7th Congressional District. Hi, hello commissioners and fellow Wisconsinites. Um, great to be here. My name is Janelle Ludwig Krause. I live in St. Croix County in a very rural place in the woods between Baldwin and Spring Valley. And nonpartisan redistricting is very important for me for many reasons, including wanting more local control, being concerned about clean water and um, for wells, for rivers, for lakes, but that's not what I wanna talk about tonight. What I'd like to talk about is the confusion that is caused by the districts that we currently have. I, um, not only are a lot of voters confused about what their district is, but even candidates ask me to put signs in my lawn and I'm not even in their district. So there's definitely a lot of confusion. Um, I live in the 29th Assembly District, which is one big rectangular um, shape of rural area with the city of New Richmond in one corner and Menominee in the other corner. Um, my Assembly District 29 is contains part of, but not all of, St. Croix County and a little tiny bit of Dunn County. St. Croix County has three different assembly districts and Dunn County has four different assembly districts. And so I would encourage you amongst all of the criteria that you need to <laughs> weigh to consider using county lines, especially in rural areas. I understand it doesn't make as much sense in big cities, but in places that are rural where we have strong identity with our counties and we know where all the county lines are, I think it makes a lot of sense and would um, prevent a lot of confusion. The other one I want to mention, and maybe this isn't even possible, I haven't heard anyone else mention it, but um, I live in the 7th Congressional District, obviously. Um, the chunk of Pierce County that has mentioned, been mentioned before, I think by Kim Butler, um, is not in the 7th Congressional District, even though it's in our Senate District. And same is true of the little chunk of Dunn County. And so I wonder if there's a way of either nesting Senate districts in congressional districts, or at least at times using the same line because it um, would decrease confusion for voters. And 
despite not only do voters struggle to know what their districts are, um, but it also creates a big barrier for new people wanting to vote for the first time. It's very confusing to understand and we wanna encourage as many people as possible to participate in voting process. Um, and it also dilutes our ability to build pressure and talk to our legislators as groups because we have to work with some people for certain legislatures and other people for other legislators and um, it confuses a lot of people and dilutes our, our ability to have our voice heard. So thank you so much for serving on this committee. It's really fantastic. Um, I wish you well. <laughs> thank you. The next individual is David Fudgrotsky from the 7th Congressional District. David? Thank you. Greetings. My name is David Fedrosi. I live on Big Lake in the town of Garfield in Polk County. Thank you for the opportunity to participate this evening. Professionally, I'm a certified community planner. I retired in 2011 after 33 years in Wisconsin public service, including eight years with the state of Wisconsin and 25 years in county government. Would like to offer you a perspective from someone who actually managed the redistricting process at the county level during the last four redistricting cycles. The redistricting process certainly advanced with technology from 1981 to 2011. So I will focus on my latest experience in 2011 as planning and zoning director for St. Croix County. Contrary to what we witnessed at the state level in 2011, the local process was nonpartisan, collaborative and transparent. Our local process was nonpartisan because almost all local elected positions are nonpartisan. Therefore, the process was largely void of political party bickering or mischief. Our local process was very collaborative. We relied on the Wisconsin Counties Association and the Wisconsin Legislative Reference Bureau and Legislative Technology Services Bureau for guidance, data, and technology. Throughout our six month process, we were in continuous interaction with all 35 municipalities in the county, not only to ensure fair and equal representation among local and county voting districts, but to also support municipal efforts to organize wards and districts for effective and efficient electric, elect, elections administration. As you might have heard recently, elections are a big deal in Wisconsin. We also made several presentations to community groups to keep public informed of our work in progress. Lastly, and most importantly, our county and local process was extremely transparent. The process was governed by the County Board Administration Committee with published agendas, minutes, and work products. The public was welcome and invited to comment. We held separate public hearings on the tentative and final redistricting plans. All draft and final working doc documents were posted on the county website as the process progressed. We ultimately used the digital census data and our geographic information system to develop and compare alternative redistricting scenarios on the fly in public meetings. Imagine my dismay watching what happened at the state level with the results of our good faith work. I don't know that the process or the results of the gerrymandering was illegal, but it should be. I am pleased that your commission is in place this time around. Good luck with your work. And thank you again for allowing me to participate. Thank you. Um, the next individual is Calvin Dexter from the seventh congressional district. Calvin. Oh, sir, you're muted. Thank you, I'm Calvin Dexter from Wausau, and thank you for hearing me and for your essential work. How we are governed affects every issue that is presented to those who govern us. And now democracy itself is under attack in this country. Americans are rightly concerned about rigged elections, but elections are not rigged by fraud, but by voter suppression and partisan gerrymandering. We take pride in our representative democracy, we have encouraged other countries to adopt our form of government, and we've criticized regimes that deny their citizens self-government. Decades ago, the Soviet Union held elections, but the Communist Party won every one of them. There is no representative democracy when elections don't affect the outcome. Since 2011, Wisconsin legislative elections always resulted in the same party maintaining firm control. 
In the assembly, for example, the same party always wins a solid majority of seats, even when they decisively lose in the total of votes cast statewide for those seats. Elections don't determine the outcome. That's not rep representative democracy. That's more much, much more like the elections in the old Soviet Union. The purpose of representative democracy is self-government. There is no self-government when election results are predetermined by partisan gerrymandering. Only those loyal to the political organization have any say in governing. Safe in their gerrymandered districts, legislators need not listen to anyone else. My state senator has never responded to the contacts I've made to his office over the years, and my assembly representative responds only with form letters. Partisan gerrymandering corrupts the system and discourages participation in representative democracy. Partisan gerrymandering also inflames the partisan divisions that this country suffers from. Legislators seeking re-election shift their focus to the primary election. Satisfying a political party's base becomes more important than representing all of the legislators' constituents. Extremists are encouraged and the majority is frustrated. Partisan gerrymandering has enabled many legislators to ignore the will of the roughly 70% of Wisconsinites who favor nonpartisan redistricting. The gerrymanderers just don't care. They're more interested in partisan control than they are in democracy and good government. Lincoln spoke of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The current redistricting process makes a mockery of Lincoln's words. It subverts democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The next individual we have is Diane Posner, Posner from the 7th Congressional District. Diane? Diane, can you hear us? Oh, you are muted. I see. Here we go. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Diane Posner, and for the past 20 years, I have been a resident of Washburn, Wisconsin, the little town on Big Lake in Bayfield County. Our rural communities up north in Bayfield County are known for many things as tourist destinations and as the home of indigenous peoples for our Big Top Chautauqua tent shows and our Bayfield Apple Festival. Diverse and rich communities of artists and educators, doctors and musicians, loggers and family farmers. I'm going to be honest with you. I have never been the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. In any gathering of my peers, I am usually the one nodding and listening because you know what Abraham Lincoln said, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Recent events, however, have caused me to reconsider. I've come to believe that not only does every person have a right to be heard, they have a responsibility to educate themselves on the issues and speak up. Our country's Declaration of Independence held certain truths to be self-evident. Self-evident means so obvious that it doesn't need to be explained, even to me. It goes on to say that governments are supposed to derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, I may not be the sharpest crayon in the box, but no matter which party is drawing the lines, gerrymandering is wrong. Elected officials shouldn't choose their voters. Voters should choose their elected officials. The founders of our country fought the War of Independence over fair representation. The health of our democracy depends on the integrity of our electoral systems. Over the past several years, Wisconsin has repeatedly made the national news for having some of the most gerrymandered maps in the nation. Choose elected official. Current the founders of our were ruled out the war unconstitutional by a federal court in 2016 because they unfairly dilute the votes of over half of the state's citizens. This is a violation of the First Amendment. 
most Wisconsinites want members of the legislature to work across party lines. By the end of summer 2020, 54 counties in Wisconsin passed fair maps resolutions and of these 17 passed a referendum. Wisconsin should implement an independent nonpartisan commission for redistricting based on the model used in Iowa and keep the process transparent. Then the millions of dollars of taxpayer money that have been spent defending lawsuits against gerrymandering could be used instead to provide tangible actual assistance to those Wisconsinites who need it now more than ever. And maybe Wisconsin could get, could get back to being famous for our amazing cheese and our Green Bay Packers. Thank you for listening and thank you for all your hard work. Thank you so much. And I agree, the cheese is important for us to get back to. Um, the next individual we have is Krissa Ostanso from the 7th Congressional District. Krissa? Hi, and thank you so much. I'm Krissa Stenso. 30 years ago, my husband and I moved to Ladysmith, Wisconsin to because we purchased an optometry clinic there. So we started running our business and raising our kids. And I had a little part-time job as a parent educator. And I think the people in Ladysmith maybe thought that Chicago girls were pretty nosy because in order to get to know my community, I was I've always been in the habit of asking lots of questions, you know, to my patients, other parents, how are you doing? Where do you work? What's it like there? You know, is everyone pretty happy? And they were kind of surprised how nosy I was, but they kind of liked it and they would tell me lots of things. <laughs> and it, it's still going on today. I, I just really like to keep in touch with, you know, what's it like for everybody living in my community? And what I learned was, you know, at about the 10 year mark that wages were getting even worse. We had lost a lot of unions in our town. Um, meanwhile, I was familiar with their healthcare situations because of my job there and healthcare outcomes were getting worse, you know, with our county data. And I could see that access was getting much worse. The benefits were getting, you know, worse and people were just avoiding doctors, even if they were employed and had benefits because of those high deductibles. Um, let's see, I thought to myself, oh, they would, you know, in my conversations, it was obvious that everyone agreed that we needed better wages, we needed good health care, you know, and some other really popular issues. And I just couldn't, I wanted to see why is it that these things that we all agree on, just cannot seem to happen here. <laughs> so I um, got more involved with my county party and with Citizen Action of Wisconsin. And shortly I learned about money and politics and gerrymandering. And this was after my kids had finally left the nest and it was a horrible feeling to see that while I had been so busy and always thinking that the government was just rolling along fine and I all of a sudden I was just shocked into knowing how badly we had gone off the rails and really wanted to know. I actually felt kind of bad that I hadn't been paying attention and I wanted to know what could I do to help now, you know. So I started knocking on a lot of doors. I talked to everybody that would listen about fair maps, got the resolution passed at our county um, with a lot of help from other people in my community. And then we ended up eventually also passing the referendum by a pretty good percentages in just this past election. Um, I'm still wondering, you know, why can't we have Medicaid expansion, which polls high, everybody seems to agree, you know, that at least we shouldn't just farm all our healthcare money away to other states and not keep any for ourselves. Thank you, Krista. You know. That's been three minutes. Thank you. Oh, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, good, and, and just a quick reminder again for folks, if your testimony runs a little long, we still want to make sure that um, we receive your testimony. So if you would like to submit your comments on the People's Maps Commission website, we still encourage you to do so. Have a good evening. And um, the next individual is Joan Cervenka from the 7th Congressional District. Joan?
We may need to move up. Maybe star. Hi, this is you? Joan Cervenka. And you are. I want to thank you. Am I there? <laughs> thank you very much for having me, uh, letting me in on this. I live on the Namakagan River on the south side of Hayward. And I just want to share a very short story I learned this year when I was helping with some registration for voters in our community. It's a story, uh, it's an old story. It has to do with no representation, and I bet Jason already knows this story. It's a story of destruction of graves and communities and homes. In 1908 to the 1920s, the financial interests of the logging companies uh, got their eyeball on the Chippewa River. The Chippewa River and Flambeau Improvement Company wanted to build a dam. They did. They flooded over 525 acres because there was no representation of the communities from the town of Reserve. In April 1916, the township, the town of Reserve was split, it was gerrymandered, split into five different townships. Those townships voted in favor of the dam. The communities were destroyed. This story, you can probably get it better firsthand from talking to Paul Domain from the the Couture community. What I would like from you is to remember the past, not just the past 10 years, but the long past. I'm not really familiar with all the rules and laws that you have to follow. I would love you to follow the one person, one vote, voter representation. I love independent redistricting, population, ethnic, racial composition, and historical legislation relating to treaties and bring in the treaties and the government-to-government obligations you have. That dam went from the Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Light Power Company to NSP to XL. There's a good story that ends after that with some taking over the dam, but I just want to end with you. Thank you. No representation leads, can lead to the destruction of communities and homes and graves. It's horrible. Thank you for all you're doing. One vote, one person. Let's consider the historical legislation and the treaties and get the list of the tribal consultations from Jason and probably from Mr. Hill, who gave testimony previously. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, the next individuals, we're getting a two-for-one special. It's Grace and Bill Caggio from the 7th Congressional District. Thank you. My name is Grace Caggio. This is my husband, Bill. We live in Troy Township between Hudson and River Falls. We're in Congressional District 7, Assembly District 30, and Senate, Dis um, Senate District 10. I grew up in a conservative home, and though my political views evolved away from my families, I've always maintained an appreciation for their perspective. I believe it's important to listen and empathize with what matters to them, even if we don't agree. As we know, gerrymandered districts guarantee politi politicians their seats, whether they listen to the voters or not. This explains why the Wisconsin State Legislature can get away with doing nothing meaningful about COVID, or why our Congressman Tom Tiffany could vote to not certify the president presidential election, our votes, despite the fact that the same voting protocol got him elected. I teach a course in leadership at the university. Research in the neurosciences has found that when leaders accumulate unchecked power, they begin losing their ability to empathize with their followers. Case in point, Recently, Tom Tiffany sent out a taxpayer-funded survey asking for feedback from his constituents. Sounds like he cares about what we think, right? The survey asked only three questions about the police, education, and the national debt. He did not ask about healthcare or climate change, which concern many of us in the seventh district. Even worse, the yes, no questions were completely biased to one perspective. For example, one question read, and I quote, some politicians want to strip longstanding legal protections from police officers and dramatically cut law enforcement budgets to de defund the police. Do you think this will make Wisconsin's neighborhoods safer? End quote. There is nothing in this question that acknowledges issues of accountability or systemic racism. This insulting survey shows that he's really not interested in listening to our perspective. He simply wants a affirmation of his own agenda so he and his party can move forward with it. Gerrymandering locks in the power of one party and creates leaders who don't have to empathize with the people they represent. I look forward to the commission producing district maps in a nonpartisan and transparent way that we all can support. No. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I would just like to add to this about the consequence of 
what a secretive, closed, redistricting partisan map got, got for us recently. And it was on full display in January 6th when we had an insurrection in our house. We had a Confederate flag in our house, the flag of racism, the flag of treason, the flag of hatred. That was in our house and it was in our capital. And yet after that happened, we still had 100 House members vote to decertify elections. That is what the non-transparent, secretive, partisan process gets us. And it needs to change. I, I, I urge you, I encourage you, find the transparency to make this process come into the daylight. Have it be something that'll disinfect the poison that is now gerrymandering. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you both, have a good evening. The next individual is Don Dunphy from the 7th Congressional District. Don, I think you're on mute. There, that should be there better. you are. <laughs> Hi, my name is Don Dunphy. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And uh, I live in Merrill. Um, I have been involved in politics for about 20 years now. I, I uh, formally held office as the uh, local district attorney. And um, I have uh, come to uh, the belief that uh, gerrymandering is uh, other than uh, getting money out of politics, the most important uh, issue uh, that we need to address in Wisconsin. And um, I have left, um, I spent about uh, 20 minutes this morning uh, writing out a, a written uh, bit of testimony. So I'm not going to go over all of that again. Uh, but um, it's just that um, since we've had such gerrymandered districts, it's pretty clear to me uh, that our representatives, and I'm, I'm talking about uh, specifically uh, our assembly people and um, our senators, state senators, um, could care less uh, what many of their constituents think because they're insulated from any sort of electoral pressure. Uh, to give you an example, uh, several years ago, I was at a, a public hearing that was conducted, or I guess it's, it, it was a forum that was conducted jointly by my assembly person and my, my state senator. And I brought up uh, the issue of Medicaid expansion uh, and pointed out that uh, we could... Uh, reap the benefit of many millions of dollars of uh, federal funding for our Medicaid um, program if we would accept the expansion. And also that it was very popular with uh, the constituents in our community. Um, both the Senator and the assembly uh, person um, acted as if I wasn't there. I mean, they talked over my issue. Um, they uh, gave me some uh, statistics that I later looked up and found out they'd been produced by a uh, partisan uh, organization. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure that I'm not unique. Uh, I feel that if we are to ever to have uh, responsive uh, representatives in Madison. We have to do away with gerrymandering. And I hope the commission's work will lead to uh, fair maps in Wisconsin. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. The next individual is Joel Lewis from the seventh congressional district. Joel. All right, thank you for giving us this time tonight and uh, thank you for all uh, serving on the People's Maps Commission. I think this is a really important thing that you're all doing, so thank you. Um, so I've uh, been politically active, uh, you know, where I've really been out like knocking doors and talking to people for about a decade now. Um, and I've seen, I, I guess like the focus on how I've seen the districts change uh, in that time. Uh, so for instance, the 85th Assembly District, 
uh, which is where I live, Wassa, um, mostly. Um, that used to be a more competitive district, and now you know it's it's kind of been a 60-40 uh, the last couple of elections. And the only time a Democrat uh, did win it in the time that I've been active uh, was because there was a, a Libertarian candidate running that took some votes away uh, from the Republican candidate. But otherwise, it's not a competitive district. Now, when I talked to someone like my grandfather, who was pretty active in the area, it was a very competitive dif- district and was often referred to as a purple district. So that has changed uh, since the last time the lines were drawn. Also, the 12th Senate district, uh, so a little further north, uh, where a couple of the people that I see on the screen here I know uh, live, uh, that was also a more competitive district. And now it, it doesn't seem, no matter how hard uh, you know a challenger works or how much they raise, that they have a chance. Um, and so I guess this this is problematic, not only for the party that wants to challenge an incumbent, but it's also problematic because the incumbent themselves, they don't have as much of a motivation to listen either, right? Like they, they're not, their fear of being challenged is is so much smaller. Um, and, and they basically are gonna do exactly everything their party wants or those that influence the party and not what their constituents want. Uh, and and the reason that is is because their party could primary them, right? That's like you know, so they have to they're kind of put into this position. And so I think that it really threatens our representative democracy, and it doesn't allow our legislators uh, to to really effectively represent us. Um, and so that scares me, and it makes me wonder, uh, you know, how many people are are scared away from voting or scared away from the process because they think nothing's going to change anyway. We're not going to be able to get someone to win no matter what we do in that, that race. Uh, and so that really troubles me because we need more people active. We need more people involved. And, and I think that this gerrymandering that's, that's occurring, that's really something that can be measured uh, is, is scaring people away. So again, thank you all for your time on this and for uh, listening to us. And uh, again, I'll also be submitting a written testimony. Thank you. Thank you, have a good evening. The next individual we have is Aaron Webster from the seventh congressional district, Aaron. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Erin Webster and I'm from Russ County. In September, 2017, I was part of a group that responded to a resolution for Russ County to support nonpartisan map redistricting. It passed overwhelmingly with only one person voting no. In June of 2020, I was again part of a group that requested Russ County vote yes to put a referendum on the November ballot to allow the people of Russ County to vote on whether or not they support the nonpartisan redistricting of maps. On November 3rd, 2020, Russ County passed the nonpartisan redistricting referendum. Our democracy is founded on our ability to vote. Through partisan redistricting of maps, both political parties at different times have afforded themselves the opportunity to have the elected officials pick who their constituents are instead of having constituents pick their elected officials. When maps are drawn in such a way, it creates a system where every vote is not equal, nor as important. Some instances make it nearly impossible for enough votes to be cast for certain candidates to win. It is not right for either political party to use redistricting to their advantage. I believe in fair maps for everyone in every election. In 2021, new district maps will be drawn based on our 2020 census. Our voices need to be heard. Fair district maps is a right that every Wisconsin voter should expect. Currently 55 counties have passed resolutions and 28 counties have passed a voter advisory referendum in favor of ending gerrymandering. Four of the remaining 17 counties have passed municipal resolutions. To date, there will be four more counties and two more municipalities with a referendum on the April 6th, 2021 ballot. This issue isn't about taking sides. It's about creating a process for taking the census information and drawing up maps that best serve the people and the communities those people are in. In 2011, 58 counties were split among legislative and congressional districts. Communities should not be split by district lines. This sets communities up for unequal representation. Elected officials should be concerned about an entire community or county, not just a part of that community or county county that is drawn as their district. When elected officials in power look at how we vote and decide where to draw lines based on our vote, that is wrong. This issue is about our democracy, our ability to vote and believe that our vote is meaningful is crucial to the democratic process. Every voter deserves to have a process that is fair 
and transparent and above board. A Marquette Law School poll conducted in 2019 shows that 72% of Wisconsin voters favor nonpartisan redistricting. I ask that through voicing my concerns to the People's Voice Commission, our voices will be heard and respected. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. The next individual we have is Brian Ewert from the 7th Congressional District. Brian? Thank you for all the time and energy that the commission is devoting to this extremely important issue. I've lived in Marshfield for 28 years. I'm a kidney physician. I've also been a healthcare executive and I've been a candidate for the 7th Congressional District House of Representatives seat. So I've seen the district from multiple perspectives and come to know it. So speaking initially just to Marshfield and Wood County, um, echoing on some of what Ms. Stevening Rowe discussed, each assembly district in the state has 55,000 people. Marshfield has a population of 19,000. We could very easily be nested within an assembly district, but we are split where the eastern fourth of our town is cleaved off and salamanders its way up to the western edge of Wausau. And in the Senate district, it's even more egregious. That same boundary down Peach Street splits us into two Senate districts. And so our Senate district takes off here in Eastern Marshfield and ends up in Mr. Bissonnette's county. Again, totally fracturing our ability to be represented. So Marshfield could easily be nested within one. The county, a very similar story. We have four assembly districts for a population of 73,000. And we have three Senate districts. Clearly the entire county could be nested within one Senate district. The county could have one and a half assembly districts and be more fairly represented. Other people have spoken to the consequences to the people of the seventh district. As someone who commits my life to caring for patients, I see it from the healthcare perspective. The needs of the patients are not being met. It's already been mentioned about the failure to expand Medicaid. And that's because our legislators are so secure in their positions and they are beholden to party interests outside of the seventh CD, not to the voters, because they know they will always be reelected. Our own assembly person from the 69th told us as much that he could not represent our interests or else he would lose his ability to function within the party because his allegiance was to the party. As a previous person spoke to, it had more to do with the allegiance to the Communist Party in Russia than to the people. We are seeing an analogous situation here in the 7th CD where party allegiance takes precedence over the responsibility to represent the voters in the district. So again, thank you for your good work. We need new maps. We need maps that represent the people. Thank you. Thank you. The next individual is Brian Ewert from the seventh congressional district. Brian? Uh, I'll see my three minutes since you already gave them to me. <laughs> oh, okay. And then last individual we have this evening is Vic Verma for the seventh congressional district. Thank you for having me this evening and thank you for all your work. Um, I'm, I've been involved in politics and advocacy for 16 years or over 16 years. Um, I moved to Wisconsin about three and a half years ago from Texas. When I lived in Texas, we knew that we had, we, there was partisan gerrymandering, um, I, uh, but it pales in comparison to what we have in Wisconsin. To give you an idea, in 2018, 54% of the the assembly vote went to Democrats. They got, Dem Democrats got 36% of the seats. In the state where, of Texas, 48% went to assembly, of the vote went to assembly candidates and 45% of the seats went to, to Democrats. It was much closer, okay? It was much more in line. I wouldn't expect it to be exact, but there's a huge differential. Um, as has probably been mentioned before tonight, 55 counties in our state have passed resolutions at the county board level and 28 have passed referendums. And uh, bears repeating an issue like Medicaid expansion, which is in 38 out of 50 states. And in every state that borders our state, um, every one of those states has Medicaid expansion. We, 
here in Lincoln County, Merrill, where we passed a, both a resolution and a referendum on, um, on fair maps. We also passed a referendum on Medicaid expansion. However, our elected officials will not even think of hearing about Medicaid expansion for the same reasons given before. They do not feel like they have to listen to the voters and will not listen to voters, even though this issue has upwards of at least 70% statewide support on this with respect to Medicaid expansion. Um, we don't have relationships with the legislators because they don't feel like they need to have relationships with us. And, and that's probably true if you're in the opposite party. It's probably true if you're in the same party, to be honest, because they're not even catering to the voters of their own party. They're catering to special interests that put them into office. Um, and as in a contrast, I lived in Texas and I'm, I, I'm a Democrat, but I had re Republican legislators probably farther to the right than what we have here. But I had relationships with them because we didn't have the partisan gerrymandering problem to the extent that we have in Wisconsin. And in, in, in the process, we have a scorched earth legislature where neither side talks to each other, everybody's hostile to each other, and nothing gets done. They're not even coming to work. They did not really come to work much last year during a pandemic to the extent that the legislature did anything. They just tried to stop the governor from trying to keep us safe. And in the process, put us as citizens trying to figure out what we needed to do to be safe because the governor could not could not implement his own plans without interference from the legislature, which was going to the Supreme Court. So we see what the results in the process and they do not serve the state well. They do not serve the citizens of Wisconsin well. Um, I live in the 35th Assembly District. There are small parts, um, there are small parts of three counties there's five counties in the district, only one whole county, Lincoln County, where I live. There's part of Langley County. I'm not sure if it's half or a little more than half. And then we got little bitty pieces of Oneida, Marathon, and Shawano counties, of which, again, the communities of interest are being violated because we don't really have any relationship with those groups of folks. It would seem, I don't know the numbers, that Lincoln and Langley could be one district. It would be Thank easier... You, to, to work with. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. And thank you to all the members of the public who testified this evening. Chair Ford, I will now pass it back to you to close out the hearing and adjourn. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for coming out uh, tonight. Thanks to all the public uh, members who provided testimony this evening, as well as our um, uh, two expert speakers this evening. I want to thank the members of the commission for uh, asking some very uh, uh, pertinent and very funny questions as well that we'll take uh, with us to our next meeting and uh, uh, dive into a little bit more in our process of trying to remain transparent and trying to create a process and a map that is uh, fair and balanced as our public testimony has uh, really attested to. So um, again, thank everyone. And uh, as a reminder, the commission will hold another virtual public hearing on February 11th uh, in the first congressional district. Uh, registration to testify will be uh, for the February 11th hearing will open soon. Uh, however, you can submit uh, written comments uh, to the commission at any point in time uh, using the public input form on our website, wisconsin.gov, uh, front slash people's maps. Uh, with that being said, this evening, uh, our hearing is adjourned. Um, good to see you guys and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, everyone. Thank you for Thank letting you. me speak. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, guys.